regular season is rushing to the finish line. And tonight from Buffalo, the Bulls and Bowling Green will both feature offenses that love to wing it. We'll serve up some Tuesday night primetime football now. Welcome to Buffalo and UB Stadium for ESPN College Football Primetime. It's the Bulls of Buffalo hosting the Bowling Green Falcons. A very important game in the MAC for two teams in a must-win spot tonight. Not only for the MAC playoff race, but also for bowl eligibility as well. In the MAC East Division, both Bowling Green and Buffalo are in the middle of the pack. What a season the Temple Owls are having. They are the pace setter in the East and over in the MAC West. It's Central Michigan, five and zero in the conference. 7-2 overall, a very competitive race there down the stretch as well with Northern Illinois. As we welcome you once again to Buffalo, I'm Bob Shoes and alongside Brian Greasy. Thanks for joining us tonight. And Brian, if you're a football fan that likes offense, you pick the right game tonight. Yeah, we may be going up and down the field tonight. Two of the best offenses in the MAC, both averaging over 400 yards a game. And for Bowling Green, it's almost exclusively through the air with their quarterback, Tyler Sheehan. He has been wonderful this year. 15 touchdowns, only five interceptions. But he's throwing the ball more than anybody in college football this year, so he is working hard. But Tyler may be the most overworked quarterback in college football, but he might be the luckiest because he has this man to throw the ball to, Freddie Barnes, and he's quite simply the, the best wide receiver in college football this year, period. He has 99 catches in eight games, over 1,000 yards and nine touchdowns, 34 more catches than the number two receiver on the list. I wish, honestly, that I had three Freddie Barnes when I was playing college. Well, there's no question that Freddie Barnes is a weapon. For the Buffalo Bulls, though, they get the job done through the air as well. A little bit more balance, multiple targets out there to throw to. Well, they really do, and they also have good balance between running the football and throwing the football. And their quarterback, Zach Maynard, has a lot of toys at his disposal. Naaman Roosevelt and Brett Hamlin, his two senior wide receivers, combined in their careers have over 5,000 yards receiving and 33 touchdowns. Tremendous weapon. And when Maynard doesn't feel like feeding these two guys the ball, he just turns around and gives it to his freight train, Ike Naduka. Last week, he had 172 yards and three touchdowns on the ground. He is a physical presence. We had some great wings and pizza last night. We expect to have more after the game, and we have a menu tonight for Brian Greasy as well. On the menu tonight, his high five, five unexpected candidates for the Heisman Trophy. Not the names that we all talked about at the start of the season, to be sure. The top team's remaining roadblocks as far as the BCS is concerned. We're going to take a look at what lies ahead, not only for TCU and for Boise State, but also for Cincinnati. Because on the phone tonight, we've got the head coach of the Bearcats, Brian Kelly, he, of course, cut his teeth in this very conference, and now he has his team knocking on the door for a potential shot, who knows, at maybe a national championship. Dave Clawson, at one point when he was the head coach at Fordham a decade ago, was the youngest head coach in America. He was an assistant here at Buffalo, actually, back in the early 90s. Last year, the offensive coordinator for one year at Tennessee, and then the opportunity came up at Bowling Green, literally hours after he was let go when Philip Fulmer's crew was dismissed. And, of course, a man has been almost inadvertently a lightning rod for some controversy in terms of the fact that Turner Gill is still the head coach at Buffalo. Does such a great job with this program. What an impressive man to sit with yesterday. It's hard to not close your eyes and picture him one day, Brian, standing at a podium and accepting the job at a BCS school. Well, and he, he is impressive when you sit down with him. And I know when he sits down in front of boosters, they are of the utmost impression of this young coach right here. Buffalo won the toss. They elected to receive. So we're going to see Zach Maynard, Naaman Roosevelt, and Brett Hamlin take the field first. And we are underway. Basically, again, a must win for these two teams if they want to keep their bowl hopes alive. Ed Young on the kickoff return. Tries to turn the corner and can't get out past the 20-yard line. It's a Buffalo kind of night, actually, for this time of year, about as perfect as we could have asked for it. A little breezy, but 42 degrees, no rain or lake effect snow is in the forecast. So it's pretty good weather to throw the football, and that's what we expect from both of these teams tonight. Zach Maynard 
has had a terrific season at quarterback for the Bulls. 61% completions, 14 touchdowns. He has 11 interceptions, but he's loaded those interceptions up in a couple of bad games. And he'll go play action on first down. Wide open is Hamlet. All the way out to midfield, a gain of 30. And you, you see the athleticism of Zach Maynard right here. He's a lefty, and he's a young kid. He's only a sophomore, but they like to get him out on the perimeter and use his feet. Throws very well on the run, as you see right there. And you're going to see a lot of this kid right here, Hamlin, number 88. Both he and Naaman Roosevelt are the best players on this offense. You're going to see them catch a lot of balls tonight. Now it's Nduka. He has a lane. Well, you called him a freight train. <laughs> he freight trained a tackler there. Lawrence Roll helped pave the way as well. As we take a look at our KFC impact. Yeah, play. and there you see him. He is a freight train. He's averaging six and a half yards a carry. It's key for him to play well tonight and maintain balance in this offense. We've talked about Naaman Roosevelt. He's got 25 career touchdowns and 3,000 career receiving yards. A lot of NFL scouts like this kid. And junior safety, Devontae Shannon, is a tackling machine in the Buffalo secondary, a two-time first-team All-Mac player. Pitch out to Nduka. And he's brought down at least a yard shy of a first down. P.J. Mahone came up to make the stop. We talked a little bit with Danny Barrett, the offensive coordinator for Buffalo last uh, last night, and he was really excited about Nduka. He hasn't played a whole lot of football. Only his fourth start, but uh, he has got a lot of potential and runs downhill and has got low pad level, and he can create some mismatches on linebackers. Duke on third and short has the first down. So a big pass play to Hamlin, followed up by three runs by Nduka. And Buffalo on a march at the top of your screen. You'll see the offensive starters right now for the Buffalo Bulls. I like to start here, you know, come out, run the football. Everybody expects these teams to throw the football. You know, they're number two and three in the league in offense, and a lot of it is through the air. But I like getting your young quarterback, Zach Maynard, some some rhythm here early with the running game. Take some pressure off of him. Pitch out to Nduka. And there's not much there. Maybe a yard. It'll be second down and long. James Schneider made the stop, and Bowling Green plays a base 4-3 defensively, and it's a group that has struggled this season, Brian, putting up numbers. They're 10th overall in the MAC, allowing about 390 yards a game in total offense and they allow 28.4 points per game. They do, but keep your eye right there on number four, Sanderson. He is their best player on defense. He'll be all over the field. He's a linebacker, but he really plays like a third safety. He'll be uh, blitzing a lot in the secondary. Play action for Maynard. He'll tuck it under and take off. Down the sideline, Maynard steps out of bounds right at the first down marker. There you see, this is a talented kid. He's got a lot of athleticism. They want to get him on the edge, as we mentioned. And there he is on a naked bootleg. Nothing down the field. Don't force it. He has 11 turnovers this season through the air, which is way too many for Turner Gill in this offense. They, they want him to look downfield, make a play if it's there. If it's not, hit your check down or use your feet, get a positive gain, and keep us in rhythm. the spread the read option for Maynard he'll give it to Nduka and Nduka on the dive will pick up about three yards Cody Basler second for Bowling Green this year in tackles made the stop and Maynard can be a threat to run correct well he certainly can I mean as you saw right there both uh, throwing the ball and tucking it and running it but uh, they like him it's just a matter of him having an opportunity to learn how to play the position he's only a true sophomore and this is his first year playing his ninth start he's got to learn the position and as he gets more and more time in this offense which is not easy to learn he'll get better and better and make better decisions but he clearly has the tools to do the job Again, play action fake, rolling out, throwing on the run. He's got his tight end, Michael Marr, first and goal at the three-yard line for Buffalo. 
And again, you see him rolling out to his left. You wonder, they're going to have to find some way to, to roll him out to his right, but this is working for him. He rolls the left, and that is a tight window, folks, and not an easy throw when you're running parallel with your tight end to put that ball on him. Any margin of error there could be an interception, but if I'm Danny Barrett and Turner Gill, I might put a few rollouts to my right end, you know? <laughs> you don't want to have those kind of tendencies on offense. And Duca on first and goal. And Buffalo makes it look awfully easy on their first drive of the game as Nduka scores his sixth rushing touchdown of the season. And the Bulls take the early lead. And a good start for this offense, being physical up front. That is what Turner Gill preaches from his old days in Nebraska with Tom Osborne. We have to be physical and nasty up front. And right there, you saw that offensive line come off and allow Nduka to get in the end zone. Principe's extra point is good. A nine play, 80 yard scoring drive. Bowling Green takes the field next. Can Freddie Barnes of the Falcons offense answer the opening touchdown from the Bulls? It's seven nothing Buffalo. A great start for Turner Gill's squad. Buffalo takes the 7-0 lead over Bowling Green. Bob Schusen and Brian Greasy at UB Stadium. And Brian, Buffalo's a team that has not gotten off to good starts this season. They have been outscored this year 61-27 in the first quarter. And opponents have scored on five of their opening eight drives in the eight games they've played. So that's got to be a confidence boost, I would think, for Turner Gill. Well, and it's really good if we have a young quarterback to get his feet uh, wet in a positive way on the first drive is big. A squib kick taken at about the 32-yard line. And it'll be pretty good field position out to about the 43-yard line for Bowling Green. Gordon Dubois came up with the football, but no, the officials ruled down by contact. So Bowling Green with great starting field position for Tyler Sheehan. This is his 34th start tonight. The senior from Cincinnati has been a mainstay at quarterback for the Falcons. So far this season, nearly 2,700 yards passing, averaging 335 yards per game, third best in college football. Sheehan well protected over the middle. He finds his tight end, Jimmy Scheidler. Down to the 41-yard line as we take a look at our KFC Impact players for Bowling Green. Well, we talked in the open about this man, Freddie Barnes. Every time he steps on the field, he's averaging 12 and a half catches and 131 yards. It's just phenomenal. His counterpart, Adrian Hodges, will benefit from all the attention paid to Barnes. He'll work in the slot, work the middle of the field. He's got a bunch of catches and touchdowns. And Jared Sanderson is their leader on defense. Undersized, but he's an effective pass rusher. And now we see Freddie Barnes out of the Wildcat. We were told by Dave Clawson and Warren Ruggiero, the offensive coordinator for the Falcons, that we would see Freddie Barnes get the football. Barnes was a high school quarterback, so it's not that unusual for him to be behind center. No, he was a quarterback in high school, and he's very uh, adamant that that has helped him be a better wide receiver. He understands what Tyler Sheehan is looking at and seeing on the field, and it helps him be on the same page, and we'll see more of him in the Wildcat. He's such a great athlete. You've got to get him touches as much as you can. That's Barnes in motion. Throwing on the run and hitting the hands of Jimmy Shadler again. A good pass from Sheehan. And Shadler dropped it. It sets up third down and long. And you're going to see, uh, you're not going to see many runs in this offense. <laughs> We've seen three straight passes, and uh, I would be surprised if we saw a running uh, play from Bowling Green, but they're going to be in the shotgun most of the time. And last year, Tyler Sheenan was almost exclusively in the shotgun, but this year he'll be under, under center some, in the gun some, but they have not scored enough in the first quarter, as you see. They've only scored two touchdowns all season in the first quarter, so they need to start faster. Four-man rush for Buffalo on third down and long. Sheehan feels the rush and goes down. Bruno LaPointe there for the sack. Now it's fourth down and probably about eight as Sheehan may have picked up a half a yard. You're inside the 40-yard line. Way too long for a field goal attempt. Looks like Bowling Green leaves their offense out there on fourth and long. Yeah, I don't think there's any doubt that Dave Clawson has tremendous confidence in this offense, more so than probably his field goal kicker, so he's going to leave his best players on the field. 
So already going for it on fourth down, a long eight, close to nine. And Sheehan backed away, but a false start will be called. False start. Offense, number 68, five-yard penalty, remains fourth down. And now Bowling Green might punt. Now you're outside the 40-yard line. Now it's fourth down and 13. And, yes, they're going to send Nick Avanelli out there to kick it away. Yeah, that's a whole different ball game when you go from 8 to four to 13 yards on the fourth down. But you got to believe that to Dave Clawson, wanted to get a touchdown in the first quarter they haven't had many and he wanted to get one right there but this is the right call uh, Benelli tries to angle it Hamlin calls for a fair catch and fields it at the 18 yard line so Buffalo has the football again but we come back midway through the first quarter the Bulls with a 7 nothing lead ESPN's College Football Primetime, brought to you by The Home Depot. Visit homedepot.com. More saving, more doing. That's the power of The Home Depot. And Timberland Earth Keepers, take it all on. Here in Buffalo, the Bulls with a 7-0 lead, and they have the football back inside their own 15-yard line midway through the first quarter against Bowling Green. So back to work for Zach Maynard. And this Buffalo offense... The University of Buffalo reinstated football in 1977, and Maynard might be the best quarterback, or certainly one of the best, that they have had since. Bouncing into the near side, and Duca, obviously a tall order for Maynard, replacing Drew Willey. And there's a flag down on the play. Holding offense, number 89, 10-yard penalty, replay first down. Saturday at noon Eastern, the number four Iowa Hawkeyes return to action. They'll take on Northwestern. Can Ricky Stanzi follow up last week's heroics and keep the Hawkeyes in the hunt for a spot in the BCS championship game? College football presented by Cars.com on ESPN, Saturday at noon Eastern. For more, log on to ESPN.com. Good first drive by the Buffalo offense, but a penalty early puts them in first and then 16. And Duca gets it out to the 10-yard line, a pickup of three. But again, since Buffalo reinstated football in 1977, Zach Maynard is the first quarterback to throw a touchdown pass in each of their first eight games of the season. So for a sophomore to take over for a veteran last year that was a tremendous quarterback, and it's hard to imagine that Willie can't find his way into someone's NFL camp. Maynard has had a heck of a season. Yeah, he really has, and he took over for Drew Willie, who was a four-year starter here and, and had tremendous success. But uh, Maynard's been doing a good job so far this season. And Duca gets loose. Breaking tackles. Cut down at the 17. About six yards shy of a first down. And the thing that he has going for him here at Buffalo is he's got a, a great supporting cast. He's got two wide receivers that are tremendous. He's got this running back in Duca that is averaging six and a half yards a carry. And uh, you can see that, that he has had success in some of the non-conference games. Eight interceptions or eight touchdowns, two interceptions. But... He's had some critical errors in conference this season with nine interceptions against MAC teams, and that's why they're one and three in the MAC this year. Third down and six, a flip to Mario Henry, and Henry comes up about a yard shy of a first down. Stop made by Jarrett Sanderson and Angelo Magnone. The ball popped out, but Henry ruled down by contact. Still, though, it'll be a punt for Buffalo from inside their own 20-yard line. And you can see there a little conservative with the play call with Maynard backed up in his own end on a third and long. Uh, Bowling Green is very good on third down and on their defense, only allowing 32% conversions on third down. And Turner Gill did not want to uh, have a turnover interception there in his own end zone with Maynard. John Rahuna bobbles the snap and has it blocked. It's loose. Picked up by Bowling Green down inside the one-yard line. P.J. Mahone came up with the ball. It'll be first and goal Bowling Green at the one-yard line.
one-yard line as Rahuna could not control the snap. Well, and Turner, Turner Gill wanted to avoid a turnover with his quarterback, but right here, it just dropped the snap, and there's Mahone, number five, that comes through and gets his hands on the football. Big play early in this football game. Now, there were a few Bowling Green Falcons there, but Marquise Quillis may have been the one that'll get credit for the block. Recovered by Mahone, and here comes the Bowling Green Falcons at the one-yard line. Out of the Wildcat formation, Willie Jeter takes the direct snap. And he will get stuffed. No gain. Richie Smith led the charge for Buffalo. It'll be second down and goal at the one. Well, Bowling Green has had some difficulties in the red zone. You see, last week against Central Michigan, they had five possessions, and they only got one field goal out of it. You're not going to win any football games if that's your red zone efficiency. And then to turn the ball over twice uh, in that game really killed them. Again, it's Jeter. No mistake this time. Touchdown, Bowling Green. So the Falcons get on the board. After the block punt. Well, they finally got another touchdown in the first quarter. <laughs> Only two all year for this high-powered offense. And Dave Clawson's happy that uh, he'll take those touchdowns any way he can get them. A touchdown drive of one yard or 99 yards. He'll take it any way he can get them. At Norsick, tacks on the extra point, and we are tied at seven. How often are big plays made on special teams that turn the tide? Well, they are, and right there, a big player in this game, tied up. Bowling Green gets a free touchdown, just about set up on special teams, as John Rahuna, the punter, for Buffalo, muffs the snap, has it blocked down to the one yard line. A couple of plays later, Willie Jeter goes over. And now Buffalo will get the football back in a 7-7 tie. Phillips with a line drive kickoff, and it bounces inside the five yard line and rolls inside the pylon out of bounds for a touchback. In the 2008 MAC championship game, Naaman Roosevelt had three touchdown catches, and this capped a storybook season for the Bulls. They also returned a couple of fumbles for touchdowns in the third quarter, and Buffalo, an above 500 regular season, they got themselves into the championship game, and then they pulled off the upset and beat undefeated Ball State 42 to 24 as Turner Gill hoisted the trophy. They win the conference title, and that led to a lot of offseason speculation about where Turner Gill might end up next. Maynard rolls out, again throws on the run. Diving catch made by Hamlin. Did he get a foot down? No. Incomplete. Again, the same play that they've been running, the rollout with Maynard and a good throw. And it looks like a good catch. Uh, I'll review yes. that. Like they should go upstairs and review that. It looks as if his left foot comes down and makes contact before he lands out of bounds. Right there. Right there, yeah. It looked like his foot was clearly down on that, but... Now the replay officials would have to buzz down to the field, and they have done that before Buffalo play is under further review. runs this next play. That's a terrific catch by Hamlin. Oh, it's certainly a terrific catch, and you'll see right, right there. Yeah, it looks like his foot came down inbounds, and he definitely has possession. There's no question about the possession. Watch the right foot, bottom of your screen. Yep, right there. Good use of the circle. <laughs> <laughs> it was a moving target. I'm just hoping that that's the replay with the circle that they saw in the replay booth. <laughs> Try to help him out any way I can, you know? 
Hamlin doesn't get nearly the credit that Naaman Roosevelt does, but Hamlin's numbers this season have been tremendous. He's up to 50 catches. He had never had more than 38 in a season before. Roosevelt has four 100-yard games this year, so he's drawn the lion's share of the media attention. But these two players have combined basically to be most of the offense for Buffalo. It's those two and Nduka. Yeah, but Hamlin gets a lot of the looks, the single coverage looks, because everybody's doubling Roosevelt, and you know he's fifth in the in the MAC in receiving. We've got the top three receivers, three out of five receivers in the MAC are in this game today with Roosevelt, Hamlin, and obviously Barnes tonight. <laughs> Maybe a few scouts uh, watching this football game. Freddie Barnes this past week was officially named one of the 10 semifinalists for the Bolitnikoff Award. And as far as college football fans are concerned, they might not be familiar with Freddie Barnes, but they would be familiar with many of the other names on that list. You got Eric Decker at Minnesota, Marty Gilliard at Cincinnati. Golden Tate, Jordan Shipley, Mike Williams, who After just left the Syracuse. The receiver's foot touched in bounds prior to his knee touching out of bounds. We have a completed catch, first and 10 for Buffalo at the 36-yard line. So a terrific catch by Hamlin is rewarded. First and 10 for the Bulls. for Maynard. He gives it to Mario Henry, and Henry's brought down by Darius Smith. And this is a, this is a new wrinkle for Buffalo. Didn't run much of the read option with Willie a year ago, but with Maynard's athleticism and his ability to run with the football, they like to, to sprinkle in the read option a little bit, throw the screen game, get him on the perimeter, on the edge, a little misdirection in the short passing game. That's the staple here for Buffalo on offense. It's Danny Barrett, the offensive coordinator for Buffalo. Second and six, and it's a free play for Maynard. Low throw hauled in by Terrell Jackson, and now let's head to the studio and Ryan Burris, Sports Center, right now. All right, thanks, Bob. Georgia running back with Sean Ely says he doesn't think Florida linebacker Brandon Spike should have been suspended by the team for apparently trying to gouge his eyes out in Saturday's game. Spikes will set out the first half of this week's game against Vandy. Kobe Bryant may be out of tonight's Lakers game in Oklahoma City. He skipped this morning's shoot-around with flu-like symptoms. No word from the Lakers on if he'll play. Sports Center, 11 p.m. ESPN. Bob? All right, Ryan, thanks very much. Offsides was called on Kevin Alvarado, and Turner Gill took the penalty rather than the catch to make it second down and one. Stutter step out the line and a first down for Mario Henry. How about the penalty levied by Urban Meyer? Was it enough? Yeah, well, I, I can appreciate Ely uh, coming out in support of Spikes, but uh, I do think he should have been suspended. There's no place in football for that. There are things that go on on the bottom of the pile, but to, to physically try to injure somebody in such a sensitive area as your eyes, I mean, we're not just talking about football. We're talking about life. And, and to, to mess with somebody's eyes, uh, that is no has no place in football, and I think the suspension was awfully light for just the first half of the Vanderbilt game. Maynard again rockets one to his roommate, Naaman Roosevelt, for a first down on the run. Very impressed with Maynard's accuracy on the move, a gain of 12. Yeah, and Danny Barrett told us uh, yesterday they want to get him on the move, and we were asking for a rollout to his right, and here you get it. You see how he gets his hips down the field, and he's able to uncork his hips and, and get velocity on that football, and at the same time be accurate. That's the key on the run. Maynard already five for five for 82 yards here in the first quarter. And he'll throw it again on first down. Again on the move, and again finds a man wide open, and this time Michael Marr with a drop. That's tough when that's your first incompletion. 
Yeah, and they keep, they, they run the same play. They're going to come out on the edge, run one guy high, you see him up here, and then they're going to have one guy low, and then the tight end is going to come across the deep in the middle of the field, and that's a one, two, three read. He reads high to low on the outside, Maynard does, and then if nobody's there, he'll come back to the middle of the field to the tight end. He's hit him twice now. It should have been another completion right there. This time Maynard pulls it under and runs it himself and picks up close to seven yards. Cut down by P.J. Mahone at the 35-yard line of Bowling Green. It'll be third down and about four. This quarter's replays are brought to you by UBMD. Turnovers are a big reason, and block punts and kickoff returns for touchdowns. As someone who does the Jets on the radio, we learned that painfully this past week. The total yards don't always tell the story. And a block punt by Bowling Green down to the one-yard line gets them on the board in spite of the fact that this first quarter has mostly been dominated by Buffalo. Third down and four. Maynard will try and dive for it. And he's out of bounds right at the first down marker. It depends on the spot. He reached the football out beyond the marker, I think, as he stepped out of bounds. Well, he's, this play, there was nothing, nowhere for him to throw the football. And you see his pure athleticism getting out on the edge to make this play. It's just a quick three-step drop. He's got good protection, but there's nobody to throw the football. And now he just takes off and runs right around Bowling Green defense for the first down. Well, they marked him down a yard shy. It's gonna be fourth down and one at the 32-yard line. Not the friendliest of spots for Buffalo, but no doubt for Turner Gill, they'll go for it. Jafron Gill comes in for his first carry of the night, and the true freshman has the first down. How about that? We've seen Nduka, we've seen Henry, we had yet to see Gill and the true freshman, his first attempt of the night, and he converts a fourth and one. Wow, I thought for sure we'd see the freight train right there in Duca, but they like this freshman. He's 220 pounds, he's a big back, and he keeps his legs churning and converts that fourth and one. They got a stable of backs here, Duca and Thermalis and Henry, and that freshman uh, right there, he's got a, a bright future. Well, now it's pure spread on first down, an empty set. And Maynard right up the seam. Down to the 10 yard line, first and goal. As Jesse Rack, who was named to the Mackey Award midseason watch list, comes up with his first catch, a gain of 20. And a great throw right down the middle from, from Maynard. Good job throwing the ball over the linebackers. You're going to see right here the linebacker has got to get the tight end down the field, and he's got to clear that linebacker before he can throw the football. But then he has to put the right amount of touch on the football to get it in front of the safety. A good throw right there and a good catch. That's the true freshman again, Jafon Gill, in the backfield to the left of Maynard. He takes the handoff and gets shut down inside the 10 at about the 8-yard line. Cody Basler made the stop. Cody Basler's a player that the Bowling Green coaching staff feels has really started to come into his own the last few weeks. A senior, a captain, and he needs to rally his defense because it's 7-7 on the scoreboard, but it was a first quarter that was dominated by Buffalo's offense. We're tied at 7, heading to the second quarter. A big game for these two teams in the back. A blocked punt by Bowling Green, returned to the one-yard line, gave them their touchdown. Outside of that blocked punt, the first quarter belonged to Buffalo. We're tied at seven, but it was two long drives for Turner Gill's squad, and they're in the midst of drive number two. 12 minutes and 10 seconds time of possession in the first quarter. Yeah, and that's a, just domination. This is the 11th play of this drive for Buffalo, and they have been able to convert on third down and keep the drives alive, and now it's time for them to punch it in. They haven't been very good in the MAC. They're ninth in the MAC in the red zone. Second and goal. The lob pass looking for Hamlin. Incomplete. Adrian Spencer may have been face guarding. No flag comes out. It'll be third and goal at the eight. He played that really interesting. He didn't turn back to look for the ball, Spencer, but he didn't put his arms up either. So even though it looked like he may have been face guarding, he didn't put his arms well, he did get that one arm up. Yeah, that, that could have very easily been called face guarding, but as a receiver, you've got to fight back to the ball, and that will force that, that interference call. But 
Hamlin didn't fight back very much right there. Kind of sounds like a bitter old quarterback talking about a receiver <laughs> didn't help the guy out. <laughs> Third and goal at the eight. Trying to help the team. Here comes the blitz. Maynard under pressure, and he'll go down. Back at the 19-yard line. James Schneider brought him down on the blitz. Yeah, they brought the corner off the edge, which uh, Maynard never saw him coming. And good job by the defense. You're going to see right here number four, Sanderson. And then outside of him, you're going to see the corner coming. Four guys to the weak side, and the offensive line is not going to hold up against that blitz. you got to get rid of that football. Prince of B, only two field goals shy of tying Buffalo's all-time field goal record. This one from 36 yards away. And he's got it. That's his 34th career field goal. He's got 203 points in his career at Buffalo with a flag down. Hey, run into the kicker there. A personal foul for roughing the kicker. Oh, boy. Called against Bowling Green. This is going to be a first down, and Buffalo's offense is going to go right back out on the field. Watch four in white, Jarrett Sanderson. Yeah, he just clipped the uh, foot. Personal foul. Roughing the kicker. Defense. Half the distance to the goal. Automatic first down. So it's first and goal for Buffalo, and that's not a mistake you would expect a senior and one of your best defensive players to make. Well, that's a tough call right there. I mean, he's given tremendous effort. He's laying out. He wants to make a play. He's a senior leader and captain of this football team. And he's just trying to make a play, and it looked like he just got too close to the kicker. That's an effort penalty. And, you know, Dave Clawson, he won't be as upset with that penalty as he would one of the other personal foul penalties because that was an effort play right there. He just got too close to the kicker. Off the board. So Buffalo takes the points off the board, and they will go back to the offense first and goal from just inside the tent. Henry inside the five, down to about the two-yard line, carrying P.J. Mahomes. Well, and Buffalo is really rushing the football well. They come into this football game with a lot of momentum rushing the ball, and Bowling Green has not been able to stop. They are last in the conference against the rush, and they are just going to get this ball pounded down their throat until they can prove that they can stop the running game. up on second down and goal. Mario Henry to the pylon. Touchdown. So the roughing the kicker penalty costs Bowling Green at least three. And if Buffalo convert on the extra point, it'll be a four-point penalty. As the field goal comes down and a touchdown goes up. And you can see this Buffalo team came out to play tonight. They are being physical up front. This offensive line and the fullbacks, tight ends are all blocking because they know that Nduka can do some special things and Henry and Thermalis on the edge. Principe's extra point is perfect. And the Bulls have a 14-7 lead. A big mistake leads to the touchdown run. You can see right here, it's just great blocking. It's not, not even a... Not even a doubt on that one. On the edge right here, they pull the guard and toss the ball. And if, if Bowling Green is going to have any shot to win this football game, they have got to stop Buffalo's rushing attack. Because if they don't, they'll keep the ball away from Tyler Sheehan in this offense. ABC Saturday afternoon college football features three regionalized games. Most of the nation will see Ohio State take on Penn State. Others will see Wake Forest, Georgia Tech, or Oklahoma State, Iowa State. College football presented by K Jewelers on ABC at 3.30 Eastern, 12.30 Pacific. Check your local listings for the game in your area as we take a look at the BCS standings. And we have a lot of undefeated football teams heading down the stretch. And some teams that you wonder in their respective conferences, can Cincinnati run the table? TCU and Boise State obviously are expected BCS busters. And Iowa still has their game a couple of weeks from now at 
Ohio State. That might be their biggest challenge left of the, I guess, those four through seven slots. Brian, who do you think is the most likely to have the great argument at the end of the year, to be undefeated, and then combine that with being able to make the best argument with what looks like to be the Florida, Texas, Alabama well, race? I think Iowa, if Iowa can take care of their business against Ohio State, they certainly will have a, a good argument. TCU will have a good argument as well with some big wins this year. And Boise State seems to be looking in from the outside. About the 18-yard line, Roger Williams has dropped. Just underway here in the second quarter. Buffalo with the 14-7 lead. We haven't seen Freddie Barnes and the offense for Bowling Green much. They only had the ball about two minutes and 50 seconds total in the first quarter. Freddie Barnes looking for his 100th catch, not of his career, his 100th catch of this season. He's got 99 catches in the first eight games. He has put up unreal numbers. That's really hard to fathom. 99 receptions in eight games, averaging 12 and a half catches. That's just out of this world, and it's not a matter of if, but when. He's going to make his first catch tonight. Play action for Sheehan. Buying some time. Avoids the rush to the sideline, right at about the 30-yard line. It's a completion to Ray Hudson. Hudson back for the first time in a month tonight. He was out with a knee injury. Yeah, Hudson coming back really helps this team. They lost th two or three of their top wide receivers at the beginning of the season, and that's really why Freddie Barnes has so many receptions. But right there, getting Hudson back involved in this offense is really going to help Bowling Green. That was only the seventh play from scrimmage run so far by Bowling Green. Trap handoff to Jeter, and Buffalo not full. A loss of a yard at the 29-yard line. And we're finally at the top of your screen, getting you the Bowling Green starters on offense. Took us till the early stages of the second quarter, but they were on the field long enough to bring you the starting lineup. You'll also see the Buffalo starters on defense. Well, that last play there was the first rush for uh, for Bowling Green, and you see why they don't rush the ball very much. They lost a yard, and now it's second and 11. The blitz picked up to the sideline, a catch this time by Chris Wright. That's his 30th catch of the season. About four yards shy of a first down. Dominic Cook ran him out. You're right, they are last, Bowling Green is, rushing the football in the MAC. They only average about 62 rushing yards per game, but total offense, they're still third. They average 403 total yards per game because they're just under 350 a game passing the football. Well, and that's the thing, because they, they attempt passes twice as much as they do rushing the football. So you're not going to rush it very well when you don't commit to it. Over the head of Barnes, an incomplete on third down, but a flag comes out. Now the Buffalo sideline is saying an uncatchable ball. Holding, defense, number 45, 10-yard penalty, automatic first down. See right here, Barnes comes off and he's got inside leverage and yeah, it could be called either way, but he did get his arm around him and and the, the pass being uncatchable is irrelevant. If you call yeah. holding, holding is a before the pass was thrown penalty. So while the ball was high, and if it was pass interference, you could have made the argument for an uncatchable ball. But holding is a penalty call before the ball's thrown. Here's Jeter. No gain on first down. He may have lost a yard. Well, if Bowling Green needs to depend upon their rushing offense, it's going to be a long night. Oh, uh, yeah, you see right here, I mean, it's uh, it's pretty clear that they're not going to make a commitment to the rushing game, but they're going to throw the football. That's what they do, and, and if they want to have some play action off of it, they've got to run the ball a few times to legitimize that, but their bread and butter is throwing the football, and I would let Tyler Sheehan throw it every down. Only a four-man rush up the seam and a drop. Again, it's Jimmy Scheidler. And that would have been a first down for Bowling Green. Instead, it's third down and 11. Plenty of time here in the pocket for Sheehan. He does a good job. 
put in the football. It's just a pitch and catch right there. He just turned his head and tried to run with the football before he secured it. Normally a sure-handed receiver. Charlotte's got 19 catches on the year, and he's a compliment. When they're doubling the receivers on the outside, Sheehan looks for him on the inside to get some matchups. Buffalo shows blitz on third and 11. Sheehan again dances in the pocket, avoids the rush, and there is catch number 100 for Freddie Barnes. His first catch tonight, it's good for a first down, and then a flag gets thrown at the end of the play. That flag came out well after Barnes was tackled. Personal foul after the play, late hit, 89 offense, 15 yard penalty. It'll be first and 10 after the penalty is enforced. Well, Sheedler on the previous play dropped a pass, and then on this play, he gets a personal foul. But right here, you see Barnes come up, and he's just, he's good at finding a hole. If he's open, stay in the hole. Be friendly for the quarterback, and right there you see Sheeler, the tight end, come in and clean up that pile. It's just, we talked about Sanderson on the block punt. That was an effort personal foul. This was just a mental foul, and that's that's unacceptable to Dave Cross and, and Bowling Green. Still a first down, though, because it happened after the play. So even though Bowling Green is back at their own 46-yard line, fresh set of downs, but now a flag is thrown again. And a false start will be called. False start. Offense. Number 56. Five-yard penalty. Remains first down. That's already five penalties for 40 yards here in the first half on Bowling Green. Sometimes when you run the no huddle offense, which Bowling Green does almost exclusively, the offensive line are at the line of scrimmage for a long time, and as a quarterback, got to get up and get the plays called and run. But let your guys sit up at the line of scrimmage for a long time. It's not easy to sit in that stand for your big old linemen. Sheen under pressure. Tucks it under and gets to midfield before he steps out of bounds. A gain of four. So Bowling Green now has 40 yards in penalties. They've only got 58 yards of total offense. So they've gone backwards almost as much as they've gone forward. They've got the firepower to go forwards in a hurry, though. I don't think they're real concerned about a first and 20. As you see right there, a good run by, by Sheehan. Gets him back, and this offense back into a manageable down and distance of second and six or seven yards. Peter breaks a tackle and picks up a couple. So it's back to third down and four. And the chase for the NASCAR Sprint Cup continues with the Dickies 500 from the Texas Motor Speedway in Arlington. Coverage begins Sunday at 2.30 Eastern, 11.30 a.m. Pacific on ABC. For more information, you can log on to ESPN.com. Big play here for Bowling Green to try and keep the drive alive. Third down and three. There's Barnes right here. Right over the middle. It is Barnes. He's got a first down and more. Still on his feet inside the 30, all the way down to the 26-yard line before Dominic Cook finally rode him down. Well, and Buffalo decided to come out and play man coverage, and I don't know if that's such a good idea against Freddie Barnes. He gets a pick underneath on a shallow cross route, and you're going to see him right here. He's going to come out. He's going to get a pick off his fellow wide receiver. When you're playing man coverage, you just can't stay with him, and that's an easy conversion for Bowling Green. I don't know about that strategy if I'm Buffalo. I may want to play zone or double cover Freddie Barnes. Now he's in the shotgun. Now Barnes will run it himself. A little flip to Jeter. On the end around, there goes Jeter. Inside the 25. Again, Cook on the tackle. A gain of about three yards. Now Jeter is, according to Dave Clawson, the head coach for Bowling Green, the second best skill guy that Bowling Green has for a team that almost exclusively throws the football. 
They said that they want Freddie Barnes to have the most touches, but they want Willie Jeter to have the second most touches. Yeah, and they, he's really dynamic. He's very small. He's only 5'7", 175 pounds. And I think when they say get him touches, it might not be straight handoffs or dives. It may be a screen here, move him around, get him in the wildcat, uh, do some different things to get his hands on the football. Injured player for Buffalo. The Bulls have the 14-7 lead midway through the second quarter. And we'll step aside for just a moment. Rafael Akabundu over on the Buffalo sideline, shaken up on that last play, but walked off under his own steam. His Bulls have a 14-7 lead, but Bowling Green driving. Bob Oshusen alongside Brian Greasy here at UB Stadium in Buffalo. A big game between Bowling Green and Buffalo in the MAC. Both of these teams in the MAC East in the middle of the pack trying to make a push at the end of the season. You got Freddie Barnes at quarterback again. And again, it's Jeter. And again, not fooled. That front seven for Buffalo. A loss of two yards. It'll be third down and nine. The thing about putting Barnes at quarterback is he was a quarterback in high school, came to Bowling Green as a quarterback, and then they switched him to tight end. So you got to believe that he is, has the capability of throwing the football a little bit out of that Wildcat. Maybe we'll see some of that later tonight. He's only got two catches, and so far Bowling Green two for three on third down. It's third down and nine. Sheehan well protected. Barnes settles down inside and has a first down and more. Down to the six yard line. It's first and goal for Bowling Green. Well, Buffalo came out, tried to play man coverage on the last third down. This time they play zone, and Freddie Barnes does a great job. You can see his feel. Against the zone coverage, you just want to find the hole and be friendly to the quarterback, as we said. And, and that's that quarterback mentality. He understands defenses. If i got to be man or zone, how to run my route. First and goal at the six. Jeter off the left side. Keeps the pile moving, close to a touchdown. Brought down probably the length of the football shy of the goal line. Devontae Shannon and Scott Pettigrew combined to hold Jeter out of the end zone, but it'll be second down and goal. What a tough run that was right there by the kid. 175 pounds, Jeter, he's gonna come through and he's gonna get walloped right here. Stays on his feet, puts his head down, moves the pile. See the strength of that young man right there. Jeter again, right up the middle, walks in for an easy touchdown. And Bowling Green, who had little to no offense in the first quarter, opens up the second quarter with a great drive. And they're on the verge of tying the game. I think there were 11 rushes and seven passes on that drive, uncharacteristic for the Falcons, but a couple of those rushes were negative plays, but in the end there, you saw the commitment to the rushing game pay off for Bowling Green. Four six extra point. Just sneaks inside the right upright. No, they wave it off. They say no good. Boy, from the end zone look we just had, it looked as if it got inside the upright. I think Norsic thought it was good as well. So it's a one-point lead for Buffalo. A man who cut his teeth in this very conference and might be in a national championship position this year was Brian Kelly, head coach of Cincinnati. He'll join us next. Nick Avanelli missed the extra point for Bowling Green, so it's 14 to 13. Although, another look. The officials are right under the uprights. Obviously, they have a better look at it than we do, and maybe the depth perception is a little off, but I think Dave Clawson was looking for clarification. Yeah, it's hard to tell right there. The, the thing about that is, is it's an extra point, and normally the ball goes low on an extra point. By the time it gets to the uprights, which are not far, it should have still been low enough for them to make that call correctly, so they had a better view of it than we did. Still a very important and very impressive 14-play, 82-yard scoring drive that took up over seven minutes. A one-point lead for Buffalo, though, as they're about to get the football back, and 
in a moment. We're going to be joined by Brian Kelly, the head coach of the Cincinnati Bearcats, one of the great stories this season in college football. And they've got, if they have a quarterback controversy, it's of the best kind because they had one of the best quarterback performances going this year in college football with Tony Pike. As he was unconscious, he gets hurt, and Zach Kolaris comes in. He's got nine touchdown passes and one interception in relief. So that's a nice problem to have as Buffalo's about to get the football back. A good kick comes down to Marcus Rivers, who muffs it at about the seven-yard line. And can't get started. Out to about the 18-yard line. And Coach Kelly, it's Bob Oshusen and Brian Greasy. First of all, thanks for joining us. And second of all, we want to publicly acknowledge that we had the Cincinnati Rutgers game at the start of the season. So, you know, we got you started on this thing. We'd like to take credit for it. Well, you know, obviously, Bob, having Brian with you as a quarterback uh, in his first game, you needed a lot of points. So we wanted to make sure that we kept them, uh, kept them happy. Well, we've got the Central Michigan flag up on the screen. I know you've got a soft spot in your heart for the conference we're calling tonight well it's just a great conference it's uh, great coaches uh you know week in and week out i mean you are challenged uh to play your very very best because uh, you know uh, other than maybe a quarterback here or there the talent level is so equal uh, coaches just do a great job i have so much respect for the coaches in the league and you know dave and turner are doing a great job with their programs hard running by gill and obviously the big story with your team is what is the injury status with tony pike uh, Tony took uh, reps for the first time today, and uh, he's a lot closer. Uh, we'll, we'll get a better feel in the next 48 hours, but uh, he's getting closer. He's pretty anxious. He wants to get in there. We'll give him another couple of days and then probably make our decision on Friday. Hey, Coach, any way that you would stick with a hot Zach Calaris when Tony gets fully healthy? No. Tony will be the starter now. Uh, obviously, you know, Zach can obviously do some great things. Um, maybe he gets an opportunity uh, if Tony's not, uh, you know, playing up to the level he's capable of, but no, Tony would be our starter coming back. Well, I think uh, before the season started, we did that first game, and we thought that Tony Pike was the best quarterback in college football this year that nobody had ever heard of, and I think he got off to a great start, but what a nice situation for you to have those two guys to go to. Well, it really is, and Zach Calaris has nine touchdowns over the last two weeks, and has really managed. He's thrown at 79% completion rate, so he's done a great job. He's just a sophomore, and uh, it's great to know that uh, we're going to be in pretty good shape at the quarterback position uh, when Tony Pike graduates. Second down and 10, a little dump off to Gill. Breaking tackles, running hard. Very close to another first down for Buffalo. We're talking to Brian Kelly, the head coach of Cincinnati. And as we take a look, Coach, at your remaining schedule, well, there are two big names out there, at least as far as Big East fans are concerned. You've got West Virginia coming in in a couple of weeks. You have to close out the year at Pittsburgh. How about another great out-of-conference matchup for you? Illinois still on the schedule. You, I mean, if you guys end up going 12-0, you're going to have earned it, don't you think? Absolutely. And, and playing a very, very tough team in UConn this weekend, you know, probably uh, if you look at anybody uh, who's had to endure so much this year, uh, it's, it's UConn, and, and they're really a football team that could be 8-0. They've lost four games by a total of about 12 points. So, yeah, we've got the best of uh, our schedule in front of us, but certainly our guys are excited about the opportunity. Coach, do you, do you buy in or look into all the different polls, the Harris polls, the BCS, what the computers are saying? Do you look into that, and how much of that discussion goes on with your team, what you have to do to get into the championship? Game. Well, we talk about what we can control. We certainly could go undefeated and, and couldn't control whether we got in the game or not if there was other undefeated teams. So, you know, what we can control is the Big East Championship. So that's that's what we focus on. And, you know, if the end of the year comes out that we're undefeated, then, you know, we'll, we'll let the polls figure that out. But, yeah, we try to stay, Brian, with things that we can control, and that's, that's a Big East Championship. But you know what, Coach? If I were to put you into some type of BCS courtroom and you could make your case, because obviously TCU would make their case about the Mountain West and Boise would make their case about beating Oregon and you know what case do you think you would make if there was someone that you know is going to listen to what your story would be? Well you know obviously the the, the Big East schedule plus uh, Oregon State at Oregon State and 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 we'll have Illinois on our schedule so we'll have a Pac-10 a Big Ten uh, we haven't ducked anybody we played everybody in our conference and uh, you know so from that standpoint we've done everything that we can we haven't played a soft schedule but again I you know, it's hard to make the case, you know, when you're 8-0. we got a lot of work to do, and uh, if we do it, then uh, I'll be ready to make that case at 
at that time. Well, congratulations on a terrific season so far, and thanks a lot for the time uh, being generous with us tonight. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Coach. Good luck. That's Coach Brian Kelly. Cincinnati with four more stern tests to go, three in their conference and one against Illinois, which obviously is not the best competition that the Big Ten has to offer, but it's not as if they're playing, you know, one double-A team or well, taking a, on a, a lower-level team. They're, they're, you know, to, to have a Big Ten team on your schedule this late in the season is pretty impressive scheduling as Maynard rolls out on third down and finds Hamlet for a first down. Again, a good throw and a rollout by, by Maynard right there. But if you're Cincinnati, you, you, it's important in this system, in the BCS system, the view factor. Uh, not only is it the computers, but you have to win and win impressively and do it in a way against a, a quality opponent that people see that. And for them to have West Virginia uh, left on their schedule and then a huge game on December 5th in Pittsburgh, I mean, that is going to be the view factor that Cincinnati needs if they want to leap over maybe an undefeated Iowa. There goes Gill again, down the sideline, Jafon Gill, inside the 20. A great job by the uh, offensive line of Buffalo. You're going to see the center, Josh Vellante, number 75, get up on the second level, and get a block on the linebacker and sustain that block and allow him to get down the field. This Bowling Green team has really struggled stopping the run. We talked with their defensive coordinator, Mike Elko. He said with their extended week, they had an emphasis on stopping the run. But with a young defensive line, they just have not been able to do it tonight. Up the seam, a touchdown. Jesse Rack, the tight end, got loose. Boy, Zach Maynard is using all the tools in the box tonight. And Buffalo takes the lead back, or extends the lead. Flag was thrown, and it may have been for Rack semi spiking the ball after, the after scoring the touchdown. On sportsmanlike conduct, offense number 82. The penalty was enforced on the kickoff. Well, and you see right there, Turner Gill is not happy with Rack. You make a good play, you get in the end zone. What he's saying right there is act like you've been there before. You know, I mean, if you're going to be a good player and score touchdowns, act like you've been there before. Do it with character and integrity. Principe's extra point makes it an eight-point game. So Rack scores the touchdown, but costs his team 15 yards assessed on the kickoff. Maynard, though, has been all but perfect. ESPN's College Football Primetime, brought to you by Orbitz. Visit Orbitz.com today and save. The beautiful lights lighting up the water at Niagara Falls, just up the road from downtown Buffalo, where the Bulls have a 21-13 lead over Bowling Green. A moment ago, Jesse Rack with his sixth touchdown catch of the season, already extending his career high, but he got an earful from Turner Gill when he got back to the Bulls sideline. Semi spiked the ball. It was enough to draw an unsportsmanlike conduct penalty and that costs Buffalo 15 yards, so the Bulls now have to kick off from their own 15-yard line. So it should be good field position for Bowling Green. Falcons still with three timeouts and two and a half minutes to go before halftime. Roger Williams across the 40, now to the 43-yard line. And let's check back in with Brian Burke. All right, Bob, coming up on the college football halftime report, I'll be joined by Trevor Maddox. We'll take a look ahead at the uh, game of the weekend in college football. Alabama and LSU, the winner, controls their own destiny to play for an SEC title. Iowa needs another comeback to stay undefeated. Did they deserve to be fourth in the BCS standings? And we'll find out what Trevor thinks about Brandon Spikes. Does the penalty fit the crime? All coming up on the college football halftime report. Bob? All right, Ryan, thanks very much. Still work to do here for Tyler Sheehan before halftime. Looking for a chunk down the sideline, up and over the head of Adrian Hodges, and out of bounds. A little bit of a force right there by Sheehan. He had 
Barnes underneath. And he tried to push the ball down the field a little bit. He's in the two-minute drill now. He's got all of his timeouts, plenty of time. Just take what the defense gives you, especially when they give you Freddie Barnes. That's what I would do. <laughs> Taking a pop was Chris Wright, but he holds on to the football, and a flag comes out. Rafael Akabundu made the hit. It was a violent collision, and you wonder if that's what drew the flag. That'd be a helmet-to-helmet. -helmet, uh... Personal foul, unnecessary roughness, defense, number 51, after the play. 15-yard penalty, first down. That's that helmet-to-helmet -helmet contact. You're going to see he's going to catch the ball here, and Akabundo is going to come in and make a form tackle right there, and it just happens that his helmet hits the receiver's helmet right right there, and that's a tough that's a tough call, but it is an emphasis in college football this year from the officials that are trying to protect defenseless receivers, quarterbacks, anybody that gets hit through helmet-to-helmet, -helmet, it's going to be a personal foul. Just tried to dump it to right over the middle. It'll be second down and 10. I think it was a good call. Well, according to the rule and, and the emphasis that, that the NCAA is making this year, it was a good call. Now, the, the question becomes, what do you want the linebacker to do? It's it's a tough deal. He's got to come up and make a tackle, a form tackle, put it in, and you're taught to keep your head up and, and make the tackle with your helmet. So it's a tough thing. Well, you know what they want the linebacker to do. They want the linebacker to hit the player with his shoulder and not his helmet. You ever try to make a tackle on one of these guys? <laughs> Second down and 10. Sheehan feels pressure coming from the blind side, unloads to Hodges. It'll be third down and 10. Stephen Means, who's a Buffalo product, just about got there for the sack. And Means, number 40 in blue, is a great story. He is kind of emblematic of what Turner Gill is trying to do, and that is take what isn't really a wealth of high school football talent, but there are some good players in the Buffalo Niagara Falls area, and get them, instead of going to Penn State, West Virginia, Boston College, Syracuse, and wherever, to play at UB. Yeah, he's from a public school in downtown Buffalo, and He's been a great find for Turner Gill, and hopefully that uh, downtown area will do well for him. The screen high, and Barnes can't hold on on third down. Now it's fourth and ten at the 33. Now what do you do? Well, again, it's the same situation they had in the first quarter, and, and I think that uh, Coach Clawson has more confidence in his offense converting a fourth and ten than his kicker making a 50-yard field goal. Well, the other option would be to punt and try and kill it inside the 10-yard line. If you don't get it here, and now a timeout called by Bowling Green, you're going to give Buffalo, with plenty of time on the clock, pretty good field position. And a reminder, Saturday at noon Eastern, number four, Iowa, back in action. They'll host Northwestern. Ricky Stanzi trying to follow up on last week's miracle win. Can the Hawkeyes stay in a hunt for the national championship game? Who knows? College football presented by Cars.com on ESPN Saturday at noon Eastern. For more, log on to ESPN.com. And just as we were talking earlier about Cincinnati and the West Virginia game and the Pittsburgh game at the end of the season that you circle, well, you circle at number 16, Ohio State on November 14th. Well, at Ohio State, but also Minnesota. That is a game that you can't sleep on if you're Iowa, but uh, they, they've had big wins at Penn State, at Wisconsin, at Michigan State. They beat Michigan. If they can beat those three teams on their schedule right there, they will have a legitimate argument to the national title game. That's the argument. I want to hear. How do you beat Wisconsin, Michigan State, Penn State, and Ohio State all on the road and not play for the national championship? Fourth and ten after the timeout. And a false start. And now you probably do have to punt as false fourth. Start. Offense, number 12. Five-yard penalty. Remains fourth down. It'll be fourth and 15 from the 38-yard line. Well, and I think the argument against Iowa will be they haven't won 
uh, in a stylish fashion. And, and while the computers don't watch the game, the computers just calculate, there is that view factor uh, that, that is factored into the BCS and the fact that, that they have been down and in some ugly situations this year and, and frankly had some calls that, that went for them in the Indiana game that allowed them to win. That's the reason why they may not make it. Avanelli sends it to about the goal line and it's into the end zone. So in the end, what should have been fourth and 10 from the 33 yard line only nets Bowling Green about 15 yards worth of field position after the penalty as Buffalo will have the ball at their own 20 yard line with 139 to go. The clock stopping with timeouts or with first downs made and all three timeouts. So that's a lot of time for a Bulls offense that has been terrific here in the first half. Yeah, and basically Bowling Green did nothing right there in that drive and to give uh, put their defense back out on the field after they've been on the field most of this first half uh, and give Buffalo an opportunity to get some more points before this half. And they'll run it with Gill up the sideline. And out of bounds, that stops the clock. This is a Buffalo Bulls offense that had to find a way to replace James Starks. They've done it by committee. They've done it pretty well. Yeah, and it's really interesting that Gill is getting a majority of the looks in this first half. You know, they've got three backs that they really like, and Nduka and Thermalis and, and Henry, but there must uh, be some things that they really like about Gill. And you see here Starks uh, was really uh, their best player coming into the season. He was a first-team All-Mac uh, running back in, in 2008. Had 1,300 yards and 16 touchdowns, and they were counting on him, and he got hurt early in the year. This time, Gill trips and falls and ends up losing a couple of yards. So when Duca shaken up earlier on here in the first half, he was playing with a sore ankle and had actually been out several games, came back in the win. I should say in the loss, but in a tremendous game this past weekend, 172 yards and three touchdowns in the loss to Western Michigan. He was a game time decision with an ankle injury and only ended up playing because Mario Henry also went out with an injury. Buffalo taking their time with the game clock down under a minute now. Third down at six, and they decided to huddle up. Quarterback draw, Maynard. Has the first down, so that'll stop the clock. 44 seconds to go in the first half. And that's interesting. You know, third and six, and they've got a lot of time on the clock. Their timeouts and uh, Turner Gill electing to play conservatively with his young quarterback. He's up 21 to 13. Doesn't want to have any negative things happen before the half, but this offense for Buffalo has been rolling in the first half. I'd, let the, I'd give him the green light. Turn on the gas in this situation. Yeah, this is conservative clock management, no question, as Buffalo seems to be content to put the ball in the freezer and take an eight-point lead to halftime. They'll run it again. Gill down the sideline. And he is bumped out of bounds at the 48-yard line. Still 12 seconds to go. So now, even though you're trying to put the ball in the freezer, you're picking up yards in such chunks that you might have to take a shot even to set up maybe a field goal attempt. You know it's a good night when you're just trying to run out the clock and then you get yourself in field goal range. You're like, oh, my goodness, I got all three of my timeouts and I'm at the 50-yard line and now maybe I should throw it down the field and see what happens. Gill with eight carries for 65 yards here in the first half. The top left of your screen, his name and Roosevelt. He's the big weapon. Hamlin in the slot right. Maynard down the sideline looking for Terrell Jackson. Knocked away. Good position for Adrian Spencer. And now with five seconds to go in the first half. Do you take a knee or do you throw a big Ben and hope? Well, I, I'm scratching my head right now. I don't know what they're going to do because I expected them to try to throw the ball, you know, 15, 20 yards over the middle of the field where they had some space and then call a timeout right when they get on the ground and kick a field goal. But uh, for them to throw the ball down the field like that doesn't, doesn't make a whole lot. It's not a high percentage throw. So I have no idea what they're going to do now. Give it to Gill. And with three defensive backs all the way downfield for Bowling Green, waiting for the Hail Mary. It's a lot of room to run for Gill. So he pads his stats 
but there were Bowling Green players waiting for him in the red zone to arrive. And if they would have called a timeout earlier than that drive, right now they'd be lining up for a field goal. That being said, it's still an eight-point lead at halftime for Buffalo over Bowling Green. So a good start to the game for Turner Guild squad. And now let's go to Ryan Burr. In the studio, it's the College Football Halftime Report. Ryan? Entertaining first half between Bowling Green and Buffalo, and we're just about set for the start of the third quarter. An important game for both of these teams in the MAC. ESPN College Football Primetime. It's 21-13 at halftime, and the hero in the first half offensively, Jafon Gill for Buffalo. Nine carries for 98 yards. Bob Schusen and Brian Greasy, and really the story, the depth at running back for Buffalo. Ike and Duca out with an injury. Mario Henry out with an injury. They were already trying to replace James Starks. Now you go basically to your fourth string true freshman running back, and he runs for 100 yards in the first half. This is like back in the days at Nebraska when they would just plug in the next guy, the freshman. And uh, tonight it's been Javon. Gill. 100 yards in the first half, and Buffalo's out, gained 2-1 to one offensively at Bowling Green. Now, Bowling Green has not gotten it going offensively. They've had some sparks with Freddie Barnes, but what do they need to do to get their franchise wide receiver going in the well, second they half? Well, they need to get the football. You know, Buffalo's had the football 2-1 to one time of possession. They just haven't had that many snaps, but they're only down 8 points, so plenty of time for Tyler Sheehan and this offense to get on track. Freddie Barnes... For him, a quiet first half is three catches for 56 yards, and that's what he had. But remember, this is a player that has already, this season, set the record for most catches in a game by a Bowling Green receiver three different times. And the newest record, 22 catches he had back in the game against Kent State earlier on this year. 22 receptions in one game, and Bowling Green will start the second half with the football. Remember, Buffalo won the toss and elected to receive. And so it's Bowling Green to the offense to start the second half. And pretty good field position out to the 37-yard line for John Pettigrew on the return. But dominant time of possession in the first half for UB. Yeah, here it is. Right, You see right here, it's 19 for Buffalo and 11 for uh, Bowling Green. You're not going to score many points if you don't have the football. And that's a good way to keep Freddie Barnes and this high-powered offense off the field. But... Right now, they're going to have a, an opportunity to start the second half with the football only down eight. As bad as you played in the first half defensively, you still have a chance to tie the ball game here on the first drive. Sheehan sets up the screen to Jeter, and Jeter's in the open. There goes Willie Jeter. Cuts it back inside the 30, still on his feet, all the way down to the 20-yard line. And we talked in the first half about Bowling Green offensively getting creative ways to get this kid the football. Not very big. You're going to see it right here on a little slip screen. Just get him the football. Allow the offensive lineman to release down the field and get a block. And then you see the speed right there for him to get down the field. But if you're not going to run the football effectively, you better be able to screen. 43-yard gain on the slip screen to Jeter. And already Bowling Green inside the red zone with Jeter, busting it up the middle. Down to about the 12-yard line for eight more yards. And I like the way Bowling Green come out and start the second half. I mean, you didn't play, didn't get very many touches on offense, as we said, in the first half. And you realize, if you're Tyler Sheehan in this offense, that you have to make the most every time you get the, the football. you got to go down and score because you don't know if you're going to get it back from Buffalo for the next five or six minutes. Jeter dancing in the backfield and can dance no further. Mike Newton has got 316 tackles coming into tonight for his career, and he made the stop. These two safeties for Buffalo's defense, Devontae Shannon and there's Mike Newton, both seniors, both with well over 300 tackles in their careers. They're only the second and third players in Buffalo's program to ever have more than 300 career tackles since UB went to Division 1A again back in the late 70s. And they've been a tandem in that secondary for a long time, third and short. Sheehan on a roll, and eventually he's tracked down by Stephen Means. 
Well, big play there. Sheehan was trying to get the ball to Freddie Barnes, and they double covered him in the secondary. And he tried to extend the play as much as he could, but a big stop for this Buffalo defense to give up two big plays to start the second half, but stiffen in the red zone. And this has been a pattern for Bowling Green. They're last in the MAC in red zone efficiency and scoring touchdowns. And this was a problem for them in two of their losses earlier in the season. Norsic from 34 yards away. And this one's good. Last time we saw Norsic, he had missed an extra point. But he draws Bowling Green a little bit closer. It's 21-16, Buffalo on top early in the third quarter. Just another balmy evening in Buffalo, where UB has the five-point lead over Bowling Green. 21-16, the hero of that last drive. That resulted in only a field goal. Willie Jeter, a slip screen for over 40 yards, got Bowling Green to the red zone, but they stalled out. Deep kickoff handled at about the one-yard line. Here comes Ed Young. Good return. Out to the 27. Tim Moore brought him down, and here comes Zach Maynard for the first time in the second half. And he had it rolling in the first half, but helped out by a terrific run game. Yeah, it really was. He was efficient in the first half. Didn't have to make too many plays, just not make the mistakes and take advantage. That one touchdown pass was big to go up and extend their lead. But when you have 165 yards rushing on the ground in the first half, you don't need to do too much as a quarterback. to the true freshman, Javon Gill. Gain of four on first down. So already 100 yards rushing, up to 102 now for Javon Gill. And if I'm Danny Barrett coming out in the second half, I realize, look, I came in, I had an eight-point eight lead at halftime. I've got a good rushing game going. I'm going to continue to pound the ball and take advantage of that. But now I want to mix in a little bit of play action because I do have two tremendous senior wide receivers. So maybe they can get a little play action game going and take some shots down the field. To the outside, low throw, hauled in by Naaman Roosevelt. And that's good for a first down. And it's just a quick out on the outside here. A little bit better throw may have allowed him to square up and make a move on Will Roger Williams right there. But it was interesting. We were talking yesterday with the coaches, and they mentioned that Roosevelt and Maynard are roommates. And Roosevelt is a senior. Maynard just a true sophomore. You don't see that very often, but it speaks a lot to Roosevelt trying to bring this young kid along the quarterback. Gill for two yards. It'll be second down and eight. Chris Jones made the stop. A true freshman defensive tackle and a true freshman running back. As we've played four minutes here in the third quarter. So there's some youth. And Turner Gill, now it's impressive what he has done with this program. They won a championship last year. But just sitting with him yesterday, he is... It's hard to describe. Distinguished might be the best word to use. He's just a very impressive leader. Gill making people miss. Another first down. Down the sideline. To the 42-yard line, to the 41-yard line of Bowling Green before he's pushed out. A oh, great run here on the perimeter. He's been pounding it inside between the tackles. and. Pretty soon, you can see the vision right there by Gill, and the, and the receiver, Hamlin, gets a block on the perimeter, springs him to the outside, and you see his talent and speed to get down the field. Now, you're talking about Turner Gill, and, and the word that came to my mind in our meetings yesterday was passion. I mean, this is a passionate man. He loves to teach these young men about relationships and what types of things they need to do to be successful. That's what this Buffalo team showed tonight. Maynard throws it to no man's land. It'll be second down and 10. And obviously, before Turner Gill was the head coach here at Buffalo, he spent his playing career at Nebraska, but the lion's share of his coaching career as an assistant was at Nebraska, part of the national championship teams in 94, 95, and 97 as a coach, and for the most part under Tom Osborne. And, and we asked him, what did you learn from Tom Osborne? 
He said he basically learned three things. How to treat people and build relationships, how to play physical football. Tom Osborne's catchphrase was always football being a game of controlled violence and how to build players' confidence by maximizing their abilities. As Maynard flips one in the flat, knocked away from roll. It'll be third down and 10. But was he a versatile player quarterback for Nebraska? He really was. He played on some tremendous Husker teams, and he was one of those guys that had the ability to throw it or run it. How about this throw? <laughs> I like that. <laughs> <laughs> the skip pass. Oh, I don't know that I've ever seen that in any other play in football other than that one. I, I had never seen that one before. Uh, he was a Heisman Trophy finalist who took Nebraska to the national title game as a player, 28-2 as a starter in his career. Up the seam, Hamlin's there, he's got it, down to the 10. First and goal at the six. Brett Hamlin got loose. Flag down, back at the line of scrimmage Number though. 75. Wipe it away, it's a holding Hamlin. penalty. Replay third down. Uh, and this hold is going to wipe out a tremendous play, throw and catch by Maynard and, and Hamlin. But you're going to see the center 75, I think, is the one that got called. And he takes him down right in the middle of your screen there. Whenever you take a defensive lineman down to the ground, the odds of you getting called are pretty good. But uh, unfortunate for, uh, for the Buffalo negates a huge play down the field. What a change as instead of it being first and goal at the six, it's third and 20. Back at Buffalo's 49-yard line. Josh Violanti, the center, a former walk-on, called for the penalty. Screen, Gill breaks a tackle and picks up a yard. Finally finished off by Darius Smith. You see there that penalty goes from having the ball first and goal on the two-yard line to now punting from your own 50. That penalty looked like a turnover. It was. It was. Freddie Barnes deep. Try and keep it away from him, I'm sure if he can. That's a nice kick, a spiraling kick. It's actually Jeter back, and he fumbles the football at the five-yard line. A scramble for it, and it's recovered by Buffalo. Alex Pierre comes up with the recovery for the Bulls. And it's basically right in the spot that they would have been with that completion to Hamlin. But you can see right here, just off the fingertips. And Pierre's there to make the recovery. Now the old rule always seemed to be if you're inside the five yard line, take your chances and let it bounce in the end zone. Are you surprised that Jeter tried to feel the punt? Well, actually they tell you to stand on, put your heels on the 10 yard line and if the ball goes over your head, let it go. And if it comes to you, then you catch it. Clock to 9-12. Well, Bowling Green scored a touchdown in the first half, their first score, when Rahuna couldn't handle a snap, a low snap, and had a punt blocked inside his own 15-yard line. It rolled to the one. Bowling Green recovered, punched it in for their first touchdown. Now it looks like Buffalo might be able to get some form of free points here off the muff by Jeter. Hand off. Gill at the goal line. He's in. Touchdown for UB. team basically hands the other a free touchdown and that's the first career touchdown run for Gill and we thought coming in this football game that special teams might play a role and now we've had a block punt and a muff punt both leading to touchdowns and, and now Buffalo's going to go for two and a timeout called <laughs> First charge timeout of the second half. Bowling Green will call a timeout on defense, and I'm not sure what the goal is here for the Bulls to go for two. Nine minutes to go in the third quarter. 
Still the free six points, a turnover on special teams. And special teams definitely playing a role in this game. Why go for two here? We'll find out. ESPN's College Football Primetime, brought to you by Bud Light, with the just right taste that's not too heavy, not too light. The difference is drinkability. Uh, if you ever come up to visit Niagara Falls, you got to go see the guys at Lenovo Pizza. And I think they knew we were coming. <laughs> Did you eat that whole pie by yourself? It was not a low <laughs> cholesterol meal that I enjoyed last night. And as you would expect, they make good wings. Not a good decision here, though. We can't figure this one out. Buffalo, 27-16 up, and they go for two for some reason. It's a keeper for Maynard. And he makes it into the end zone, and the two-point conversion is good. So the lead goes from 11 up to 13 with 9.07 to go on the third. Well, all the questions are answered if you make it. <laughs> we can only question if they don't make it, but a good run right there by Maynard to make a couple guys miss and get in the end zone. But a little bit early in this game to be going for two, I think. Interesting decision by Turner Gill, and there are going to be some interesting decisions made by Heisman voters later on this year because we have our Brian Greasy high five, meaning these are, at least in your opinion right now, the five leaders for the Heisman? Yeah, and at the beginning of the year in September, you know, we were talking about the three kings of college football, Bradford, Tebow, and McCoy, and none of those guys really are in my high five because C.J. Spiller is my number one guy. He is a dynamic player. He's made a lot of difference for the Clemson Tigers this year. Quadruple threat, rushing, receiving, kick returns, and punt returns. He is dynamic, and Mark Ingram is another guy that is a load for Alabama, and everybody in the SEC knows he's going to run the football, but he still is running the football and averaging 123 yards a game. So he's another guy. And then Clawson in Notre Dame, I think, has had a great year with 18 touchdowns and, and only two turnovers. Uh, Masoli really is the one that is my sleeper, uh, that uh, he's really gotten Oregon back on track after losing that game to Boise early in the season. I think they've made a tremendous comeback, and it's been all about him. And if you look at his numbers, they're really comparable to what Tim Tebow has done in Florida. So I think he's a sleeper there. Look out for him. Well, you've given us your five leaders. Who's the pick? Who's going to win it? Well, like I said, I like I like Spiller. Spiller is just – I had a chance to see him two weeks ago, and uh, he single-handedly beat the Miami Hurricanes in Miami. A low kick fielded by Roger Williams. And he gets shut down inside his own 25-yard line. Mark Ingram, I think, is the one player, though, that is going to be on such the national stage out of those five guys. You're playing for a team that right now might be ranked number three, but you can make an argument should be ranked number two, if not number one in Alabama. Now, there is going to be the whole world of college football watching the games that Texas, Alabama, and Florida play. And if you think at this point that Colt McCoy and Tim Tebow have at least statistically played themselves far enough behind Ingram. Ingram is going to be center stage. He really is. He has games against LSU and Mississippi State and Auburn still uh, left this year. And then the SEC title game. So he'll have every opportunity to, to perform. Play action for Sheehan on first down. Wants the home run for Chris Wright. Under throws him and it's out of bounds. Chance pass is incomplete. <laughs> Tyler Sheehan so far tonight, 8 of 15 for 146 yards. His last four games before tonight, he was averaging over 400 yards per game and threw nine touchdown passes in those four games. So. Hasn't gotten it going so far this evening. Under some pressure and just dirts it. Throws it at the feet of Ray Hudson. Saturday at noon Eastern, one of those teams that's in the national championship mix potentially. Number four, Iowa, returns to action. They have Northwestern this week leading up towards a week from Saturday's matchup with Ohio State. Can Ricky Stanzi keep it rolling? And can the Hawkeyes stay in the hunt for a spot in the BCS championship game? College football presented by Cars.com on ESPN Saturday at noon Eastern. For more, log on to ESPN.com.
Well, if that team ends up undefeated, it was meant to be of the games they've played this year. <laughs> Third and ten for Bowling Green. Sheehan rockets one over the middle, and it's dropped right into the hands of Adrian Hodges. A flag down, though. It'll be a penalty against Bowling Green. And I think it's a hold in the backfield. Holding offense. Number 77. That penalty is declined. Fourth down. This Bowling Green team has had a lot of mistakes tonight with drop passes, the tight end, and Hodges right there have dropped some balls. They've had a lot of penalties. They've had two personal foul penalties, and they just do look a little bit sloppy tonight. I don't know if they came in ready to play. Fair catch made at the 36-yard line by Hamlin, so good field position for Buffalo when we come back. UB has the 29 to 16 lead. While we were away, a penalty called on Ben Carbo, backup safety for Buffalo. He was called for a personal foul just after the fair catch made by Brett Hamlin. Pulls his man down. You can see on the extreme left side of your screen, a punch thrown at the end of the play. So that costs Buffalo 15 yards of field position. And they'll start this drive back just across their own 20-yard line. The workhorse has been the true freshman, Jeffon Gill. He runs right into Darius Smith. Dwayne Woods there, pardon me, to help make the stop. Now, I expect Bowling Green to start with some run blitzes, and they've got uh, they've got pass blitzes and they've got run blitzes. And sometimes you bring uh, linebackers at angles that create havoc for offensive linemen to block. And right there, you had a defensive end that came up the field, allowed the linebacker to come inside unblocked and freed him up to make the tackle. But they've got to do something to stop the running game here for Buffalo. Green to Gill, nothing there. Kevin Alvarado stayed home and brought down Gill for a loss of a couple. It'll be third and long. Well, and nothing good happens when you take a screen back the other way, unless you're Ladanian Tomlinson or somebody of that nature, Darren Sproles. But that's a uh, freshman mistake there. When you get a screen, you need to stay out by the numbers. That's where the uh, traffic uh, is, is less. You'll be able to get down the sidewalk, as they call it, and, and make some yards. But you can't go back into the middle of the field for the screen play. A three-man rush on third down and 11. High throw over the head of Hamlin. So the Bowling Green defense does a great job to force Buffalo three downs and out. Well, and that's that's staying on schedule there. You know, Bowling Green does a good job of stopping the run with a run blitz on the first down. Then they do a good job on the screen, get Buffalo into a third and ten situation where they don't feel as comfortable converting, and young quarterback's not able to make the throw to convert. Now they're going to have the ball in good field position. Here's Rahuna's third punt of the game, and it's been exciting on the first two. He had one blocked, and then Jeter fumbled one. Both of those two plays resulted in touchdowns, one for either team, and a high kick that Jeter is going to let bounce. And it takes a Bowling Green bounce. It may have hit the leg of a Bowling Green player. No, it is touched up by Buffalo at the 41-yard line of Bowling Green. We've had plenty of miscues, though, on special teams. Yeah, we have, and it started with the roughing the kicker penalty. As we said, more of an effort penalty there, but this leads to a touchdown for, for the Bulls, and then we had a missed extra point, which could factor in this game. And then we had the fumble muff punt by Jeter, which led to this touchdown by the Bulls. Two Bulls touchdowns off of special teams miscues. Jeter tries to turn the corner being chased by Stephen Means. He loses six, maybe seven yards back to about his own 35-yard line. Josh Thomas came up 
and made the stop for Buffalo, but a great job in pursuit by Stephen Means. And they really like this Stephen Means, only a redshirt freshman, but he's got good skills. He's 6'3", 234 pounds at the defensive end position, a little undersized, but he's a young kid. He can grow into that body. And Fred Reed, the defensive coordinator here at Buffalo, really likes him, thinks that he's going to be a player. Cheater did well to only lose four. Over the middle, catch made by Barnes. And Buffalo has kept Freddie Barnes in check. He has not had a major impact on tonight's game. That's only his fourth catch. Well, they have, and I think that they're content uh, allowing him to cut, catch the underneath routes and come up and make the tackle. And, you know, talking with Turner Gill and Fred Reed right there, the defensive coordinator yesterday, he said he's going to get his catches, but we just want to limit the big plays. And if he catches three or four balls underneath and makes five, six yards, we can live with that. But what we can't live with is the 60, 70-yard play and touchdowns. Third down and eight. Sheehan up the middle, and he's got a first down to Ray Hudson. It was a good job right there. It was a fake screen to Barnes. You see Sheehan's going to fake the screen to Barnes on the outside, and then the tight end is going to come down the middle of the field. He has two reads there. He's going outside, and then he comes back inside. Gets the ball to uh, right in the middle of the field. Good job getting through his progression and allowing his feet to make that read for him. And now he backs up into the shotgun on first and ten. Swings it wide. Catch made by Hudson, but he falls after only a three-yard gain. And let's check in with Ryan Burris, Sports Center, right now. All right, Bob, the college basketball season has yet to begin, but already an upset in an exhibition game. Division II College Lemoyne goes to the Carrier Dome, and the Dolphins beat Syracuse 82-79. Lemoyne, seven three-pointers on the day. Syracuse, 24 in the polls, loses to Lemoyne Sports Center, 11 p.m., Bob. All right, Ryan, thanks very much, Syracuse fans. It was an exhibition game as Jeter gets tripped up. Josh Copeland on the tackle for Buffalo. After Mike Williams, though, walked out the door on the football program this past week. That's not the way you want to start off basketball season. Well, they don't have Greg Polish yet. He's still playing football, so <laughs> maybe he'll help him. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> if only. Third down and eight. Only a four-man rush, and still Sheehan running for his life. Boy, is that the way you want to draw it up? Draw it up if you're Fred Reed, the defensive coordinator. You bring only four on the rush, and still you get all that pressure on the quarterback. Well, they had good coverage down the field. They played man-to-man. -man. Right here you see Freddie Barnes. He may have had an opportunity to throw the ball down the field, and you see Barnes. I'm open, man. Give me the ball. But uh, there was a little bit of pressure on his quarterback back there. And a fist pump from Fred Reed after Kevin Johnson and Gordon Dubois led the charge for the Buffalo defensive line as the punting unit comes out for Bowling Green. Again, Hamlin calls for a fair catch at the 11 yard line. The chase for the NASCAR Sprint Cup continues with the Dickies 500 from the Texas Motor Speedway in Arlington. Coverage begins this Sunday at 2.30 Eastern, 11.30 a.m. Pacific on ABC. For more information, you can always log on to ESPN.com. And as we check the leaderboard in the race for the Sprint Cup, and it's Jimmy Johnson with Mark Martin's deficit getting a little bit larger, it seems, each week. wonder if Martin Gordon... Montoya and the group have dug themselves a little bit too deep of a hole to catch Jimmy Johnson. It's been hard to catch Javon Gill at times tonight for Bowling Green. That time they corral him after only a two-yard gain. Dwayne Woods again on the tackle. We had a little lull in the offensive action here in this football game, and you got to wonder, some of the adjustments made by both of these teams defensively at halftime have worked. Bowling Green is stiffened against the Buffalo rushing game, and 
And Buffalo's defense has continued to stymie the Bowling Green high flying offense. Maynard throws off his back foot under pressure. Dangerous throw. Again, it was Dwayne Woods that time coming on a blitz to get pressure on Zach Maynard. Yeah, and there was a, a blitz here on the uh, strong side. You're going to see him come from the top of your screen up here. They're going to come on a blitz late. Zach Maynard doesn't see it and doesn't have time to set his feet right there and make an accurate throw. And that's a run blitz right there on first down that Bowling Green has implemented now in the last couple of series. And they bring it to stop the run. But if it is a pass, they still have good angles and opportunity to get to the quarterback. It's a good adjustment by Bowling Green defensively at halftime. sure that Maynard was expecting the football. Trying to run for it on third down and long, a broken play, and Maynard gets popped at the 18-yard line. Roger Williams made the tackle with James Schneider. Maynard seems to be surprised when the football comes. Yeah, I don't think he had any idea that that ball, he's trying to make a call, and oh, whoops. <laughs> okay, you take it, kid. He's, and then he makes something happen. This is hard on third and 10, and then that insult to injury takes a, a vicious hit there at the end of that play, but clearly he was not ready to, to take that football, and that is not a good feeling when uh, you're trying to get something done and the ball hits you right under the chin. He's like, okay, what do I do now? <laughs> he was lucky he caught the ball. He looked back in time and didn't just hit him right in the face mask. Jeter calls for a fair catch. Fields on the back pedal at Bowling Green's 35-yard line. Well, just up the road from here in Buffalo is Youngstown, New York. That's the hometown of Dave Clawson. So he told us that he expected somewhere between 70 and 80 people from his hometown to make the drive down from what really is kind of a Norman Rockwell-looking scene in Youngstown. It's a border town. You can see Canada right across the water. And a pretty good cheering section for Dave Clawson with the Bowling Green faithful here in Buffalo. Bit of a homecoming for him. And his offense finally gets something going as Jeter goes in motion. Sheehan under pressure, looking for Jeter, does well to get the ball away, and a flag comes out. Jeter makes the catch for the first down and tack on 15 more yards. Defense, number 90, roughing the quarterback, 15 yards. Great job here by Sheehan getting that ball off, and then, yeah, whenever you drive that quarterback to the ground, you're going to get called. But Do you think he drove him into the ground? We had helmet to helmet right there and drove him into the ground. So, yeah, when he let go, here it is again, he lets go of that football. You can't take him to the ground after he lets go of the football. And Dave Clawson uh, was talking to us about Sheehan yesterday and how tough he plays. He says he never takes his eyes from down the field. If he's going to get hit, he's going to stand in there and take that hit and get the ball down the field and put his team in position to execute. Sheehan slants one, caught by Hudson. Gain of only three yards. Josh Thomas was there to make the stop, but that turns into a huge play. It gives Bowling Green on the seventh penalty for Buffalo, a first down well inside Buffalo territory. Jeter stops, then tries to start again, and Kevin Johnson just wrestles him down after a gain of a yard. You're starting to see this Buffalo defense take a few more risks, bringing Mike Newton, their free safety, down into the uh, box to stop the rushing game. They've been a little bit more successful running the ball in this second half, but that's leaving their corners on an island, and we know that Freddie Barnes is out there, Chris Wright is out there, and Hodge is three good wide receivers, and if they continue to take chances, as again they do here, with one safety in the middle of the field. It's only a matter of time before they start throwing the ball on the outside. Bowling Green's four for nine on third down. Up the sideline, intercepted, picked up by Devontae Shannon. He's got some blockers out in front. 
Shannon still on his feet, finally tripped up at the 41-yard line of Bowling Green. A flag down on the play. Well, we mentioned it. Freddie Barnes on the outside of a single coverage and blew right by the corner and he was wide open, but Sheehan did not have the time to get the ball off with an errant throw and then subsequent pick, but we'll see what the penalty is. A 42-yard return if the play stands. It looked as if the flag was thrown pretty well after the interception, although there's another flag thrown down in the area where Shannon picked it off. So this might be two separate flags for two separate fouls, and this is a lot to sort out for the officials. Well, and the best that uh, Dave Clawson can hope for is offsetting penalties, but... You gotta think it's a blocking penalty, at least on Buffalo, after the interception of some sort, whether it's a clip or a hold. But the, the, the big question is, what is the, the penalty flag that's by the, where the interception was? There's no foul for defensive pass interference. During the return, blocked below the waist. Intercepting team, 15 yard penalty, first down. Well, let's take another look at the pick as they pick up the flag for pass interference. Well, you see right here, Freddie Barnes beats him off the line of scrimmage. We talked about man coverage, but as an errant throw, if he throws the ball down the field, he's got a touchdown. But credit Buffalo for getting pressure up front, not allowing Sheehan to set his feet and throw that football down the field. That's the second time now we've seen Fred Reed in this defense elect to go man coverage on Freddie Barnes and bank on his front seven getting to Tyler Sheehan. That's a huge call on the picked up flag for Dave Clawson. Now granted, 15 yard penalty for a block below the waist on the interception return will at least back Buffalo up well inside their own 40 yard line. But if the pass interference penalty stands, it's a big first down penalty, wipe away the interception if Bowling Green still has the football. Now the officials again will stop play, and it might be that Bowling Green just called another timeout. This would be their second timeout on defense here in the second half. They called a timeout when, Bo when Buffalo was lining up to attempt a two-point conversion earlier in the third quarter. And I think Dave Clawson realized that what a big play that was and what a big momentum switch and just said, I'm going to burn a timeout so I can talk to the official. Well, I guess the question, if I'm Dave Clawson, that I would have is still, why was the flag picked up for pass interference? Bowling Green head coach is not challenged in the play that the ball was tipped. The ball was not tipped. First down. So again, if the ball is tipped, that would give you grounds to pick up a flag for pass interference because once the ball's tipped, you can hit a receiver. So we never really got an explanation as to why they pick up the pass interference flag. Well, the ball is, is tipped right there by Bowling Josh Green Thomas, number 15. That was after contact was made, though, with Freddie Barnes. So Bowling Green gets their timeout back and a handoff to Gill. Out to the 37 yard line. Eugene Fells made the stop and that brings us to the end of the third quarter. Buffalo with a 29 to 16 lead for Turner Gill here at UB Stadium as we head to the fourth quarter on college football primetime on ESPN. <laughs> if you can't dance, <laughs> then you might not want to wear a costume that draws attention to the fact that you just can't dance. <laughs> but that seems to be the goal of the crayon group here at UB Stadium. How many crayons in a box? They seem to be a few crayons short right there. Maybe upstairs, too. <laughs> we start the fourth quarter. Buffalo with the football and a 13-point lead. Out of the read option. Maynard gives to Gill, and Gill is gang-tackled for no gain, so it will be third down. And I'm sure Dave Clawson is still trying to figure out how the pass interference flag 
was picked up on the second to last play of the third quarter. Yeah, the only thing I can think of is if, if the official felt that the safety that was coming in front had tipped the ball before it got to uh, Josh Thomas. But other than that, I can't really tell you. Terrell Jackson in motion on third down and six. And the motion man catches it but falls down. A yard and a half shy of a first down. So Jackson couldn't keep his feet. And Buffalo will have to punt. Well, what a huge momentum shift that was on the interception. But credit Bowling Green defensively coming out and stopping Bo uh, Buffalo in a three and out situation right there uh, to get a little bit of momentum back for themselves. And I can't tell you what a big stop that was for them and give their senior quarterback an opportunity to come back out here and get back on the field and get in this game. And an adventure tonight for both teams on special teams. Rahuna has the punt blocked again. Second blocked punt of the night for Bowling Green, and it's picked up by P.J. Mahone again. And it's a first down for Bowling Green in the red zone. And that time it wasn't a fumbled snap by Rahuna. This is just penetration up the middle. Yeah, he just came right up the middle. Mahone right there, picture perfect to the side of the punter. And then he picks up the ball himself. He, he gets the uh, the perfecter right there, blocking the kick and recovering the, the fumble. But clearly Buffalo has had severe issues on their uh, punt protection team. Now they shift the look to put Freddie Barnes in the backfield as the eye back. And there goes Jeter in motion. The handoff, no, it's a play action fake, rolling right Sheehan, flag down. As Sheehan runs out of bounds, after a gain of three yards, we'll have to check the penalty. It was thrown by the holding referee, and it'll be holding. Number 64, 10 yard penalty, replay first down. Smith and Robinson. Well, Bowling Green has really killed themselves tonight with penalties. We talked about it earlier in the game, but they seem to have a good play. Positive play, Sheehan getting out on the edge, but uh, Albert with the holding call. and Turnovers and penalties, uh, a lot of them in this football game for both sides. Right here, we'll see if the Bowling Green can overcome that holding call. 156 total yards and penalties between the two teams. The second block punt of the night for Bowling Green. Has them in plus territory, now it's first and 20. There's Barnes, dragging across the middle, and he's dragged down by Dominic Cook at the 21-yard line. And he's been open on that route all night, and Bowling Green will have this play for him all night if they want. He just comes down underneath, give him the football, allow him to try to make a, miss a tackle, break free, but uh, you need to feed this guy the ball. Clearly, he thrives in this offense when he's getting the football. And, I don't care if it's a two-yard route, five-yard route, 50-yard route. Just get him the ball. Play action again for Sheehan. Over the middle again, it's Barnes. And he's loose down to about the eight-yard line. Very close to a first down. It'll be third down and about a half yard to go. And a great job here again against the zone defense. You're going to see he's just going to sit in the zone. Hey, give me the ball. Let me turn it up, get north and south, get as much as I can and get down. Nine yards right there on first down. That's what this kid gives you. He'll, he's able to read defenses, man and zone, and catch the ball with his hands and make a, make a move afterwards. And, and they mark Barnes down, well shy of the first down. He's in the Wildcat on third and one, and he'll keep it himself. Up the middle goes Freddie Barnes, and a hard-running first down to the five. It's first and goal for Bowling Green. And I think Dave Clawson kind of felt the same way that we did, that uh, it's time to, it's Freddie Barnes time. Second half, our guy has not uh, had as many touches as I want him to have, and he said last night he wanted to get him the ball. And uh, so he's going to get it to him. If, if Sheehan's not going to throw it to him, he's going to put him in the gun. Jeter on first and goal. Inside the five. It'll be second down and goal. Richie Smith made the tackle. And for Barnes, he now has six catches for 81 yards. 
which is a good night for a wide receiver in general. It's a terrible night for Freddie <laughs> Barnes, and that's just how good his numbers have been this season. Well, yeah, he's, he's halfway to his average, and uh, we're in the fourth quarter, so. But he's capable. He could catch 10 balls in this quarter. You never know. Second and goal from just inside the four. Quarterback draw. Sheehan tries to do it himself. And he's into the end zone with a Bowling Green touchdown. I like the call right here. Buffalo is, is playing the pass and they're playing two deep coverage down inside the red zone area. And the one guy that's unaccounted for is the quarterback in that situation and a good run there by Tyler Sheehan. Our six point after is good. And it's a six point game with 10 and a half minutes to go in the fourth quarter. And right here, you see a great block by Jeter on the linebacker there. And a good run to get in the end zone by Tyler Sheehan and got his team back in this football game. Turner Gill told us yesterday against Bowling Green, you have to have 30 points to win. His team's got 29 points, and they are still not out of the woods. It's 29-23 with a lot of time left here in the fourth quarter. Buffalo at 3-5, and 1-3 and three in the MAC East Division. Bowling Green also at 3-5. and five. They're 2-2, two and two, though, in the MAC East. So this is a game for bowl eligibility for both teams to still try and stay alive in the MAC race. The loser of tonight's game is really going to be behind the eight ball. The winner is going to breathe a lot of life back into their season. And a low kick fielded on a hop. Here comes Ed Young. Block in the back against Buffalo. Young is off to the races, but a couple of flags thrown as this return is going to come back. A very obvious block in the back at about the 10 yard line called against the Bulls. During the return, block in the back, number eight, receiving team. Half the distance to the goal, first down. ABC Saturday Afternoon Football features three regionalized games. Most of the nation will see Ohio State take on Penn State. Others will see Wake Forest, Georgia Tech, or Oklahoma State, Iowa State. College football presented by Kay Jewelers on ABC at 3.30 Eastern, 12.30 Pacific. Check your local listings for the game in your area. Based on the talent assigned to those games, I'm shocked that it's not Oklahoma State, Iowa State going to the majority of the country. <laughs> Since you and I will be, we will be in Ames. Looking forward to that one. A handoff to Gill. And he is stacked up just across the five-yard line. Kevin Alvarado on the stop for Bowling Green, and he's starting to sense the momentum shifting off the blocked punt that gives Bowling Green the touchdown. It's a one-possession game, and now some energy in their defense. Well, not only that, their defense has played well in the second half, incorporating some blitzes into their, their scheme, but now they have field position on their side. Buffalo backed up with a young quarterback. If they can stop the run here and make him throw the ball, that's to, to, to their advantage. Maynard rolling in his end zone. Throws across his body incomplete. Short hop one for Terrell Jackson. Now it's third and ten inside the ten yard line. And this is right where Bowling Green wants Buffalo offensively in third and long. And right there you see it's Bowling Green has had a lot of success here in the second half. 54 yards by, uh, by Buffalo. And Bowling Green is first in the conference in third down defense. And tonight, they've been successful as well. Three-man rush on third down and 10. High throw. Incomplete. Main and Roosevelt was open. We've had an adventurous night, though, on punts. Yeah. First a block punt here. Almost scores a touchdown. And right up the gut, Mahone. 
And the last thing that, uh, that Turner Gill wants to do right now is send his punter into the end zone. God knows what's going to happen here, but you know that Bowling Green is going to be coming with that same pressure. And they bring nine players right up near the line of scrimmage as Rahuna will punt from his own end zone. He gets it away. It'll be good field position, though. After Jeter's fair catch in plus territory for Bowling Green, down only six. Only a 37-yard punt. So Bowling Green has the football back with a chance to take the lead when we come back under 10 minutes to go in the fourth quarter. ESPN's College Football Primetime, brought to you by Taco Bell. Think outside the bus. Well, when you're in Buffalo, what do you do? Last night we went to Lenovo Pizzeria, and we did not lower our cholesterol count. They were good wings. I missed out on those last night. I'm going to have to get a few. Did you leave a few for me tonight? Not one. Not even a chance. <laughs> Plus territory to start this drive for Bowling Green. Down only six with 9.28 remaining. Sheehan shifts into the shotgun. Flips it down the sideline. And he led his tight end, Jimmy Scheidler, more to the sideline instead of going down the numbers. If he throws it down the numbers, might have been a touchdown. Yeah, it looked like he had some room on the outside. It was a broken play, and Sheehan extends a play. Buffalo's playing a lot more zone right here. And the tight end, Sheeler, was down the field free. And if he throws that ball, you're right, Bob. Down the field on the end, on the sideline, he had a play. Up the scene, Barnes makes the catch to the 22-yard line for a first down, working on Kendrick Hawkins. Tackle by Kendrick Hawkins. Well, they're starting to get hit their number one player, Freddie Barnes, into this game. Good throw right here, accurate throw by Sheehan. And you'll see they're going to play a single safety and play off of Freddie Barnes. He runs a good route, sticks him at the top. Ball's a little bit behind him. If it was in front, he may have been able to catch it and make a move, but good catch. First down, they're driving. That puts Barnes over 100 yards again. Now it's Chris Bullock all the way down to about the 12-yard line with a flag down. A flag was dropped by the linesman on the near side of the field right at the snap. This might be a neutral zone infraction. Defense, number 22. The penalty is declined. First down. So wipe away the offside penalty on Sherrod Lott. And Bullock picks up a first down. Got a first down at the one. All right. And the momentum has definitely shifted in Bowling Green's favor. Now they're going to put Freddie Barnes back at quarterback. Barnes takes the direct snap. Little shovel pass to Adrian Hodges. He dropped it. It's an incomplete pass. The crowd thinks that it might be a fumble. And the Buffalo players jump on it as if it's a loose ball. It was a clear shovel pass that Hodges dropped. It's interesting that they would have Hodges in there to take the shovel pass instead of Jeter. Hodges is the wide receiver, not used to being inside and all those big bodies around him. Maybe he was a little concerned about getting hit, but if Jeter's in there, you got to think that uh, he'd be a little bit more used to being inside the pit there and caught that ball. I like the play call. I just don't know about having Hodges the one to catch it. Not Hodge's best night. He's had a couple of key drops. Second down and 10. Sheehan lobs one for Barnes. End zone. Incomplete. Pass intended for Barnes is incomplete. Wow, it would have been a tough catch for Barnes on the outside, but with his with his talent, his level of play, I think he, he's capable of making this play, but Sheehan puts his ball in a position. But he could have gone back and got that football, but it looked like it got on Barnes a little early, and he surprised him. Didn't get his body turned around, but that was a catchable ball down here. It's going to be tight in the red zone. Huge third down and 10.
Sheehan trying to boom, buy more time. Tucks it under and runs. Short of the first down, out of bounds. Inside the five at the four. So he's a full two yards shy of the first down. It'll be fourth down and two. Well, and they covered Freddie Barnes with two guys. They had a safety over there in the corner, and then he tries to get open. But by this point, Sheehan has decided to run with the football. And Dave Flossen wants to call a timeout and talk things over with 8.15 remaining. Is he going to go for it, or is he going to kick a field goal and make it a three-point game? Well, for all of us on our crew here at Bowling Green, it's a sad day for many of us, not only here, but also in the TV sports world. We've lost a good friend. Rob Green was one of the top videotape operators in the business. Based out of Michigan, his skills took him all over the world for ESPN, but he always represented home with his Tigers cap on wherever he went. This past Saturday, while our crew was at Wake Forest, Rob was on the crew, and he was taken to the hospital in North Carolina with chest pains. He passed away yesterday. Our thoughts and prayers go out to his wife, Gila, his daughter, Cassie. Robert Green was only 47 years old. Also a big fan of Central Michigan, so he loved the Mac. And he loved college football, loved being around the crew, loved working in television. And, you know, Brian, it gives us an opportunity to, in a way, acknowledge the life of Rob Green, but also to thank all the guys on our crew. And, you know, we get the fun job of sitting up here and looking good and calling football games, but so much hard work goes into putting these games on by so many people. You develop friendships and our condolences to the Green family. Here's the fourth down and two play. Close to three. Sheehan. Jump pass into the end zone, broken up. So rather than going for the short field goal to make it a three-point game, you go for it on fourth down and a long two, and you turn it over on downs. Well, and just a good job by, by the Buffalo defense. They played a zone coverage and didn't get much pressure on Sheehan, but they decided to drop eight in coverage. It's like a picket fence back there. It's tough to get that ball through. And Good job right there by the defense, keeping that team out of the end zone and securing their six-point lead. And Rafael Akabundu came together with Josh Copeland after Copeland knocked it away. And Akabundu, for the second time tonight, is out on the field with the trainers around him as he's hurt again. But Buffalo stops Bowling Green on downs with 8.09 to go in the fourth quarter. The Bulls holding on to a touchdown lead. Bob Schusen and Brian Greasy at UB Stadium. I guess second guessing or maybe first guessing Dave Clawson not going for the field goal. Yeah, I mean, if you go for the field goal and you make it, you're down three. And if you had made the extra point earlier in the game, you're only down two. I mean, that's where that, that missed extra point comes in big. But I think he feels like his defense has played really well in the second half here and the momentum is with them. Get a stop here and get the ball back with good field position. Gill gets blown up at the one-yard line. Oh, Jared Sanderson came through and made the stop. He's the leading tackler in tackles for loss with five and a half on the season coming into tonight and for Bowling is, Green. Here he is right here. He's going to come unblocked. And they line him up in different positions. They were telling us last night he could line up anywhere on this defensive front or in the secondary. And they put him on the line of scrimmage, and he was unaccounted for. It was confusion up front. Big play for Sanderson. out to about the seven, maybe the eight-yard line for Gill. And coming up next, it's NBA Coast to Coast. We'll have live look-ins of games in progress. Can the Celtics become the first 5-0 team in the NBA? We'll have highlights from their game in Philadelphia. Matt Weiner, Jalen Rose, Tim Legler. All on the set. We'll have questions from the fans as well. So a lot to come on NBA Coast to Coast coming up next. Gets to the 
sideline and picks up the first down. Well, you take uh, the element of decision making out of the equation here. It's a design draw back in your end zone. Don't want to have your young quarterback throw the ball and, and risk a turnover. A good call here by Danny Barrett and a good execution by Maynard. And Terrell Jackson, sophomore wide receiver with a good block for Maynard. The receivers block very well for Buffalo in their run game. Certainly do. They get a lot of credit, Roosevelt and Hamlin, for catching the football, uh, but they are a big part of the running game. They keep it on the ground. Just shy of the 20-yard line. Gill is tripped up. And that's part of that's part of Turner Gill's skill is to is to everybody's purpose is clear and as a receiver you're obviously going to catch a lot of balls in this offense but you also have a duty uh, to the team to make those blocks on the outside and not only is it the offensive line in the tight ends but but those wide receivers you can see a huge uh, uh, rushing yards advantage for buffalo 223 yards tonight and that's what their top two running backs like Nduka and mario henry both going down with injury so it's been the true freshman Javon Gill that has drawn most of the work tonight, and again he gets to the edge, and again he picks up a first down. That time the tight end Jesse Rack with a good block. Rack, a great block on the edge, and can't tell you how big uh, it is for us them to be able to rush the ball out of their own end zone, but you see Rack on number five there on the second level, gets down and gets a nice cut. That's not easy to do from that position to get a cut on a safety, but when you get the ball inside your own 10-yard line, you talk about making two first downs, changing the field position, and they were able to do that on these first two drives. Not too bad when your number three running back coming into tonight ends up with 148 yards. And he's looking for more, and he's got more. Busts through a tackle, and there goes Gill. And he trips over his own man's feet at the 48-yard line. Jordan Gerald, the left tackle, was downfield trying to help pave the way. And he tripped up Gill after a gain of 24 more. And it's a great job up front of this offensive line. They're starting to hit their stride in a cutback lane there. And then you see the power of Gill to get through those two blocks. And this is what the Bowling Green defense was talking about, giving up big plays in the running game. And they have not attempted a pass on this drive yet, and I think they're content just to run the football. 172 yards for Gill tonight. This time it's Brandon Thermalis up the middle. He averages about 42 yards a game, rushing as well. His first carry of the night, good for a yard. Gill shaking up on that last play. And so they're working on him on the Buffalo sideline. He would be not only the third running back injured tonight for Buffalo, but when you look back at what they should have had with James Starks, as we talked about at the beginning of the season, he was coming into his senior year, already the career rushing leader for UB. Out with a torn labrum. Last year he ran for over 1,300 yards. Hermelis again, pounds his way. Three yard shot of a first down, and let's go back to Matt Weiner. Be sure to stick around after the game for the season premiere of NBA Coast to Coast. Tim Legler and Jalen Rose will join me. All five unbeaten teams around the league playing tonight. These fellows will break it down right after the game. A big third and three here late in the ball game. Under three and a half minutes left. Bowling Green only has one timeout. They're down six. If Buffalo can convert here, they can take this clock almost all the way down to zero. Maynard dumps it underneath incomplete. So finally Bowling Green gets the stop that they needed on a drive that has taken exactly five minutes off the clock. There is a flag down. Nope, they picked the flag up. So there is no penalty, 3.09 to go, and Bowling Green's going to get the football back, down by six. Maynard had everything he wanted there. He had a good protection, stepped up in the pocket, just was not accurate with the throw. He had his receiver open. You gotta put that ball on him, convert, and you can win this football game. We've got three touchdowns tonight that have basically been caused by adventures when rahuna has been on the field. One of those was a month by Willie Jeter, who's back deep. 
And Jeter will let this one go over his head. And he gets plowed into at the 10 yard line and a flag comes out. Sherrod Lott came down and laid out Willie Jeter. And that'll be a penalty again against Buffalo. They've only already had nine penalties for 108 yards tonight. Kick catch interference. Kicking team, number 22, 15 yard penalty, first down. So it's 123 yards of penalties tonight for Buffalo. Well, and I don't understand. I mean, clearly, you can't, <laughs> you just can't hit the guy before the ball gets there. I mean, I don't know what Lot was thinking right there, but what a big penalty because the ball was going to be on the 10-yard line for Bowling Green with only two minutes and 59 seconds left and only one timeout. Now you get 15 yards on that penalty. It's, it's big. So inside of the last four minutes, now the clock will stop when you get a first down, so only one timeout left for Bowling Green. That'll help them, and they set up the screen to Jeter. And Jeter's got a first down and more. Out to the 41-yard line, a gain of 16. And there's plenty of time here for Bowling Green. You have to have a little bit of a sense of urgency, but there's still two minutes and 45 seconds left on the clock, plenty of time. And another injured player on defense for Buffalo. The screen game tonight has been successful for Bowling Green. Yeah, it really has. And here's Jeter right here. You're going to see, as you let it roll, they're going to get, allow them to come up the field, get a pass rush, and then release their two offensive linemen, get out there and get a block. Right here, 64 and 75, Volante. They're going to get a block on the edge. And then you're going to see tremendous effort here by Jeter, breaking tackles one, two right there, and, and keeping his feet moving. For only 175 pounds, he's got some, some power in his legs. Saturday at noon Eastern, number four, Iowa, back in action. They'll take on Northwestern. Ricky Stanzi will try and keep their BCS championship game hopes alive. The Hawkeyes certainly in the hunt for a spot in the title game. College football presented by Cars.com on ESPN Saturday at noon Eastern. For more, log on to ESPN.com. Northwestern, then at Ohio State, and then home against Minnesota. That's what remains in the Big Ten for Iowa. And in the BCS standings, they are lurking at number four, right behind Florida, Texas, and Alabama. And then so close, only a couple of thousands separating Cincinnati and TCU for the five spot. And Boise State, also undefeated. The interesting one to me, Bob, is right here, LSU. LSU has eight teams in front of them, but they're the ones that control their destiny because they play Alabama this weekend, and then they're also going to play later in the year the SEC championship, and they could control their own destiny if they win out. One of the starting outside linebackers for Buffalo, Justin Winters, was the injured player. Incomplete for Adrian Hodges. So you beat down another starter on defense. Plenty of time left for Bowling Green with 2.43 to go. They have only one timeout. Sheehan just missed that throw right there, but, uh, you know, I'd get back to Freddie Barnes. He's, he's only got seven catches tonight, but if they're going to play zone coverages, he can find the hole. If they're going to play man coverage, he can beat man coverage and get open, but he is your guy. you got to feed him. Low throw, hauled in, and they will call it a catch. Ray Hudson makes the catch. The crowd doesn't like it, and now they whistle it as an incompletion. A late call by the field judge downfield. Honestly, if that had been ruled as a catch, it might have hurt Bowling Green more than the incompletion. It would have continued to roll the clock. Yeah, it was about only a three or four yard gain, so Clawson uh, is not gonna, uh, he's not gonna dispute that one. He'll let that one go. Four down territory here for Bowling Green. If I'm a Buffalo fan, I'm rooting for that to be a catch. Yeah. It's only two yard gain, and the clock rolls. Third down and 10. Again, a four man rush. She into the sideline. This time it is caught. Adrian Hodges bobbled it for a moment, held on for a first down to the 39 yard line. And credit Dave Clausen coming back the same play they ran earlier that she had missed the throw to the outside here. Hodges runs the same route and number 12 there for uh, Buffalo.
Buffalo does not get back on that throw. You, gotta, you have to secure the sideline there if you're the corner. Bowling Green goes hurry up again the middle screen. Down to the 30-yard line goes Chris Bullock, a yard shy of a first down. And you certainly at this point would think that Bowling Green would go no huddle, but they don't have to really hurry up. They have a lot of time left. And they'll sneak for the first down. Great call right there. You know, this is what they do. Bowling Green doesn't huddle, period. So this is nothing new for them. And they've got all kind of different speeds and tempos with which they operate at the line of scrimmage offensively. But when you get to a second or third and one to two, that sneak right there, get your first down and stop the clock. Sheehan throws it wide, knocked away. Coverage by Mike Newton on Adrian Hodges. And you start to think how different this game would be if on the last possession, Bowling Green had gone for the short field goal instead of going for it on fourth and two inside the five. Sure. Well, it made such a difference for Buffalo to be able to run the football and get it out of that end zone and create field position. But right here, Bowling Green has run the same play three times in a row to Hodges on the outside. Ball batted down. Richie Smith knocked it away. And again, it'll be third down and 10. Trying to get the underneath route to, uh, to Barnes again. And uh, now it's third and 10. You don't have to get all of it right here for Tyler Sheehan. Just got to get make sure you get a completion. Maybe underneath and let your guy break a tackle. Maybe get a first down. Barnes at the top of your screen. She and under pressure releases to the sideline. Right at the 15-yard line, the catch is made. Chris Wright has a first down. Again on third down and 10, a big throw from Tyler Sheehan. Big play there from Sheehan, but on the other side of the field, I'm telling you, throw the ball to Barnes. He's open for a touchdown right here to win the football game, but Sheehan is working the other side of the field. At least he got a first down, but man-to-man -man coverage on Barnes again in this look right here. Sheehan gave a glance to Barnes instead, comes back to about the seven-yard line. Again, he finds the senior Chris Wright. Josh Thomas brought him down. Two yards shy of a first down, and the clock continues to roll down to a minute and 10 to go. Now you start to think Buffalo might want to call their timeouts. Yeah, they've got three of them. Because they have three, they might be able to preserve time for a field goal attempt that they give up the touchdown. Sheehan takes the snap. Under pressure, shovels one. Flag down, it's caught by Jeter at the five. He is right at the first down marker, Holding Dane Robinson. Offense, number 56, 10 yard penalty, replay second down. Well, Robinson pulled down Sheehan, wipe it all the way with a holding penalty. Yeah, you had a uh, holding call on the right tackle, Donahoe, right here, let's take a look. He gets beat inside, that's a clear holding call, that's a, that's a tackle is what that is, but over set to the outside and quick move inside, got beat. Very important game for both of these teams at three and five on the season in the middle of the MAC East Division. <laughs> he's been open the last three plays, and right here he's beaten the corner off the line of scrimmage, and that's just stealing right there. They cannot run with Freddie Barnes. This is an important extra point right here. 31st career touchdown at Bowling Green for Freddie Barnes. Earlier tonight, Norsic missed one. This to give them the lead. No doubt about it. 39 seconds to go. Buffalo has all three timeouts, but now they trail by a point. Well, it's a good job by the offensive line, giving him time to throw this football, but 
I think in that situation with the game on the line, if you're Buffalo, you got to put two guys on Freddie Barnes. He's done this all year long, over 100 catches and now 10 touchdowns. And it took Tyler Sheehan a little while to find his good friend on that drive, but once he did, he produced. An 11-play touchdown drive for Bowling Green. Gives them the lead with 39 seconds to go. This game is not over yet. In the MAC East, Bowling Green trying to get to 3-2 and two in the conference. And even more importantly, just to keep their bowl game hopes alive, to get to 4-5. and five. You have to win at least six games to play in a bowl game. So they would take a big step forward as they come down the stretch in their season to playing a postseason game. But Buffalo... With 39 seconds to go and all three timeouts, can use the whole field to call whatever play they like. And they need only a field goal. And, you know, it's it's been really impressive to, to watch Freddie Barnes this year. I mean, he has done everything you could possibly do from the wide receiver position, from catching the ball to taking snaps at quarterback. But the best thing about Freddie Barnes is he's a humble kid, comes to work every day, works hard, he's a leader, does well in the classroom, and that's what you like to see in college football. Young from the eight. Loses steam on that return at about the 25-yard line, brought down by Jarrett Sanderson. Only an 18-yard return. 32 seconds to go. And Freddie Barnes, who was quiet throughout the first half, finally makes the big play in the closing minute to give his team the lead. You know, the thing, we saw him open a couple times on that drive, but he never came back to the huddle with, with any kind of attitude. Never said, hey, throw me the ball, I'm open. You sometimes you see those things in the NFL. He's supportive of his team, however they can make a win. Maynard up the seam, almost intercepted. Threw it behind Naaman Roosevelt. And Keith Morgan had a chance at a pick. That only cost Buffalo four seconds. Naaman Roosevelt has been quiet because Maynard has had a far different second half. Yeah, I mean, 12 yards in the second half, and give credit to Bowling Green defensively. I mean, they came in, came out of halftime with a plan to stop Buffalo offensively on the ground and force, force them to throw the football, and they haven't been able to do it. Only a two-man rush. And a drop. Marcus Rivers has it right in his hands at the 39-yard line and drops it. Uh, that's a big drop right there. I mean, there are there's 23 seconds on the clock. They only need a field goal, and they've got all three of their timeouts. It's a good throw right here. As a quarterback, you're trying to do everything you possibly can, and you just got to catch the football. You catch that, take a timeout, maybe attempt another 15 yards down the field, another timeout, and then, then you may be able to get in the field goal range. But right now, it looks tough. Loses the football. That's a fumble. And now Buffalo has to call a timeout. They recover. But with the clock winding down to 13 seconds, to 12 seconds, they finally call a timeout as James Schneider timeout. knocked it away Buffalo. from Maynard. First charge timeout of the second half. Well, and he held this ball a little while, trying to push it down the field. Right there, that ball comes out and goes backwards. His arm wasn't coming forward, so that was ruled a fumble. Well, now for tonight's most valuable player of the game, brought to you by Sonic. And as has often been the case this year for Bowling Green, Freddie Barnes makes the big play when it's needed the most. Eight catches for 122 yards for him is just another night at the office. <laughs> well, that's on the low end. It's four and a half year. under his average. <laughs> that's right, he averages 12 and a half catches a game. <laughs> I think he'll take the victory, though. This is a big win for this Bowling Green team. And Freddie is a team guy first, and there's no doubt about it. And he grew up in Chicago on the east side, and he's paid his dues and come a long way. And for him as a senior to, uh, to be accomplishing what he's doing this year and the season he's having. Everybody's happy for him at Bowling Green. Last gasp for the Bulls. Maynard 
trying to run for it, and he comes up way short of a first down. And so Bowling Green turns Buffalo over on downs with three seconds to go. It'll be Tyler Sheen to take a knee, and Bowling Green comes from behind in the fourth quarter with a touchdown drive in the closing minutes. And they are going to win it and get to four and five and above 500 in the Mac East. A big win for Bowling Green and a tough loss for Turner Gill and this Buffalo team. They controlled most of the first half, rushing the football. Just could not stop the passing game for Bowling Green in the fourth quarter, and Sheehan and Barnes were too much. Sheehan takes a knee, and Bowling Green will head home winners. What a tough loss for Buffalo as well. Played a great first half, but miscues on special teams. Two blocked punts for Bowling Green led to two touchdowns. And Buffalo falls at home. 30 to 29 is the final. As Turner Gill's team falls to three and six, and Bowling Green back in it at four and five and three and two in the division. Again, the final, a one-point lead, a one-point win for Bowling Green, NBA coast-to-coast. -coast. Coming up next, we'll go to our ESPN studios now, and Matt Weiner.